um, and where there, there's an issue that does arise in one case, they can alert the others to watch out for it in other cases. This was a small team in, in much the same way, and the, the need for an inevitability, perhaps, of, of sharing of experiences ought to have alerted them the fact that this was a problem that went beyond one case. Thank you. Can we move to topic nine, which is the acceptance of pleas? And um, to start with, um, uh, look at something that you say in relation to um, Mr Singh, and it's a point that arises in a number of cases, and the point is whether the acceptance of a plea to false accounting is um, a concession, or arguably a concession, of the absence of sufficient evidence to theft. Um, you uh, address this on page 127 of your report. It's paragraphs 351 and 352. And at the end of 351, you say that Mr Singh observed that if Mrs Misra pleaded guilty to the false accounting charge, it, it's recommended that the prosecution in respect of theft is not proceeded with. And then 352, this was arguably a concession to the absence of actual evidence of theft and consistent with an approach whereby theft was charged to encourage pleas to false um, accounting. Now, I think on the last occasion, um, you confirmed that the judgment of the Court of Appeal in Eden made it clear that it uh, could be appropriate to charge both theft and false accounting where uh, they are either put as alternatives to each other um, or where they are both advanced to cover different forms or species of criminality? Yes. Uh, would you agree that that means that the mere fact that theft and false accounting are charged in the same indictment is not of itself improper, so long as there's sufficient evidence and a public interest to charge both of the counts? Yes. And the two charges are either put as alternatives to each other or are um, referring to or addressing different species of criminality? Yes. You've also, I think, given evidence on the last occasion that evidential sufficiency and public interest must be kept under review throughout the life of a case. Yes. Um, does it follow from that that a change in circumstances may affect whether a um, continuing a prosecution is in the public interest? Very much so. In a, a prosecution pursued by the CPS, for example, if a defendant was willing to plead guilty to one count but not another, would the CPS have to consider whether it remains in the public interest to go to trial on the outstanding count? Yes. And I think the, um, at least the 2010 edition of the Code dealing with pleas and the acceptance of pleas includes amongst um, the factors to be considered the following whether the court will have sufficient sentencing powers to match the seriousness of the offending behaviour. Yes. Uh, and the wishes and interests of the victim. <coughs> yes. In a private prosecution where there isn't an obligation to prosecute, even if the evidential and public interest tests are uh, satisfied, is a prosecutor entitled to consider whether, in the light of a plea or a proposed plea, uh, pursuit of the remaining count or counts on the indictment is a proportionate use of the private prosecutor's resources. Yes. Given those things, um, why is it that you consider that Mr Singh's observation must necessarily, in fact I don't think you say necessarily, you say arguably, um, uh, arguably amounts to a concession that there was insufficient evidence of theft? Yes, and, and I don't say necessarily that was um, uh, does rep, uh, reflect Mr Singh's position. But um, take, taking it as a starting point, um, Mr Singh had reached a charging decision without setting out in any way the evidential basis for his conclusions, which means it is not clear to me where there was, on the face of it, no evidence of financial benefit to Mrs Misra, 
um, that he had concluded that there was um, a realistic prospect of a conviction for theft of £74,609.84 when there was no evidence that Mrs Misra had received £74,609.84. Um, and so he, he had charged that and false accounting with no reference to the case of Eden, no reference to why both charges were there, how one was an alternative to the other, or how one reflected different criminality to the other, but had then said um, that he considered there was a realistic prospect of a conviction for theft, but if she pleaded guilty to false accounting, then that would be sufficient. Uh, and where there was no explanation as to how he had reached a conclusion as to theft and where on the face of the investigation report there was a limit to the evidence that there had been theft, um, it struck me in those circumstances that it was arguable rather than necessarily the case um, that there was a recognition in his mind that the case for theft was not strong uh, and therefore um, false accounting um, was sufficient and if that was his mindset given the lack of evidence I, I queried why he was charging theft in the first place. Thank you very much. So it might be that even if there was sufficient evidence of theft and there was a public interest in prosecuting theft it, it may not have been in the public interest or um, at the post office's private interest to proceed to trial with the theft account if there was a plea to false accounting but you saw no um, reasoning to that effect yes. uh, on the face of the papers. Yes, and, and, and uh, I'll correct if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think Mrs Misra did then plead to false accounting and was still prosecuted for theft. So, yes. Um, That's and exactly I, and right. I saw no analysis to explain that either. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. That can come down. Can we turn to um, considerations of confiscation? I think it's right that the um, 2010 iteration of the Code did not state that the availability of um, the court's powers to make confiscation orders was a consideration that had to be taken into account as part of the public interest test. I think that came in a later edition of the Code. That notwithstanding, would it have been a proper uh, consideration for a prosecutor when considering whether to accept a guilty plea to some counts but not others, uh, or to a lesser or a different offence, to consider the impact on the court's um, confiscation powers? It would be um, reasonable to consider that, yes. And so in Miss, um, Mrs Misra's case, when um, the post office was, say, considering whether to accept a plea to false accounting or whether to proceed with the theft count, would the impact on confiscation have been a legitimate factor for the post office to consider as part of the balancing exercise? Um, in the sense that um, if the theft count reflected the actual um, benefit to Mrs Misra of the money and an appropriation by her of the money, um, which could lead then to confiscation if she were convicted of taking the money in, through a conviction for theft on the one hand, uh, and false accounting reflecting um, putting off the evil day, to use the, the words in Eden, to, to um, avoid identification that there were errors that had not involved her taking money on the other through false accounting, the latter route um, arguably not leading to confiscation. Was there any evidence that that was um, the kind of reasoning that we've just explored ever brought into account in Mrs Misra's case? No. Um, can we look more generally about uh, the issue of um, accepting pleas to false accounting instead of theft? And you address this on page 227 of your report. If that can be shown, please. Two two seven at paragraph six hundred and forty. In six forty, you say the approach to charging, as between theft on the one hand and false accounting on the other, lacked um, consistency, 
and that um, in a number of cases there was also a lack of consistency in the charging decision exhibited by the willingness to accept a plea to false accounting instead of theft. Um, are, are those comments um, limited to the particular facts of uh, one or more of the cases that you examined, or are they a general point? I think more of a general point. Can you help us then? Why would a willingness to accept a plea to false accounting necessarily imply a lack of confidence in the evidential merits of the theft charge? Uh, again, it doesn't necessarily reflect one, but, but um, where, in case after case after case, um, a charge of theft was um, selected without any explanation as to the evidential basis for it, um, particularly in relation to an evidential basis for appropriation and or dishonesty. Um, and then um, there was a willingness to accept a, a plea to false accounting which um, carried with it a recognition that there was not um, sufficient evidence of those elements of theft. It, it did raise the question as to whether theft was being charged without sufficient consideration of those elements. Uh, and also, because the charging um, decisions were such models of brevity, um, it was very difficult to see how the thought process had been gone through as to why theft was there as well as false accounting in these cases. Thank you. Can we turn to page 229, please? And paragraph 644. You say, um, however, the greater concern in a number of cases uh, uh, that I have considered was that evidence that the theft charge uh, was used as a means to pressure a defendant into pleading guilty to false accounting with conditions um, attached to the acceptance of that plea. Um, and I think you give um, three examples. Um, Huey Thomas, um, uh, between paragraph 645 and 647. Uh, Josephine Hamilton, 648. And then Alison Hall, 649 to 651. Yes. Th three examples. Yes, and, and um, one, if, if one wanted a, a, a fourth, um, Mrs. Henderson would... would Alison Henderson, too. Category. Thank you. If we can just look at those, um, the three that you've given yes. in, the, in the report, starting with Huey um, Thomas, Noel Thomas. Um, if we look at what you say at paragraph 645 um, onwards... He pleaded guilty to false accounting in September 2006, theft charge not pursued. Uh, the memorandum of the hearing noted, quote, this was pursuant to a basis of plea, which makes it clear that no blame was attributed to the Horizon system. The defendant accepted there was a shortage, but he couldn't explain how it came about. He accepted that as a sub-postmaster, he's contractually obliged to make good the shortage. And you say, in other words, the acceptance of this plea was made conditional on the repayment of monies, which, consistent with the plea, had not been shown to have been taken, and to an undertaking not to criticise the Horizon system. Um, this appears, from the material you'd seen, to have followed from a discussion between the principal post office lawyer, Julian McFarland, and the post office agents in the prosecution, in which Julian McFarland said, quote, we would have we would proceed with false accounting, providing the defendant accepts that the horizon system was working perfectly. Further instructions are that the money should be um, repaid. You say that Mr Thomas reported to the second site review that the approach taken was aggressive and inappropriate. Uh, you say that from the perspective of a defendant, it shouldn't be forgotten, there's a significant, very significant uh, difference between theft and false accounting as to outcome, theft by an employee in breach of trust in the period with which the inquiry is concerned was recognised, and you cite um, two cases, Barrack and Clark, um, from the uh, 1980s, establishing that as an offence usually attracting an immediate custodial sentence, even in a case with strong personal mitigation. A defendant confronted by the evidence of loss deriving from the horizon system and a lack of possible questions as to its reliability 
would understand that a plea to an alternative offence would increase the chances of retaining their liberty. And it's reasonable um, to anticipate they would receive legal advice to that effect. Does that include, for example, um, an anticipation or at least a hope of a suspended sentence? Yes. At 647, the post office submitted in the context of the second site review that the decision to accept the plea was reached in accordance with the code. However, as was acknowledged, there's no evidence of such a review, which in the first instance did not follow the code test. Rather than a review of the evidence, the prospects of conviction or the public interest, the only matters raised in the material that you'd see are the recovery of money and the protection of the reputation of the Horizon um, system. On a scale of concern about the conduct of prosecutions, where does what you identified there sit? Uh, I, I recognise that, that it is always open to, to the prosecution to consider whether, um, on a review of the evidence and a review of the public interest, in fact a plea to an alternative count um, meets the justice of the case. I also recognise that it is always open to the prosecution to consider a proffered basis of plea and, and identify whether that basis of plea is acceptable and if it is not acceptable to make that clear to those acting on the behalf of a defendant. Um, what concerned me here was that the discussions that I saw in the communication involving Mrs McFarlane um, were investigating um, internally their view as to whether a plea to false accounting would be acceptable in a case where she had identified at the charging stage there was a medium prospect of success uh, uh, and identifying in that context the concerns being um, recovery of the money um, and no criticism of Horizon uh, and it's Put, putting those factors together, um, it seemed to me a reasonable reading of, of what occurred was that the, um, those involved from the post office side were um, identifying their um, conditions for a plea being accepted, which were conditions of the recovery of money where there was no acceptance by the plea that money had been taken um, a, a, and a, lack of any criticism of the system, which was something that Mr Thomas had identified from interview on as being a concern on his part and would have been mitigation for him. Uh, and so that's a very long way of, way of answering your question that I think there's a very real concern that on the face of those facts, um, this was um, a, a plea that was being um, tailored to address concerns that the post office had. Um, in terms of getting the money um, and, and protecting the reputation of their computer system, um, rather than an assessment of the factors in the code by reference to um, evidential sufficiency or the public interest. Thank you. And cutting it shortly, do the same issues arise in paragraph 648 concerning the case of Josephine Hamilton and 649 and following in the um, case of Alison Hall? Yes. Thank you. Um, and I should just add in relation to, to that, those cases, um, those of, of uh, Mrs Hamilton and Mrs Hall, were considered by the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal um, took a very um, clear view of, of what they considered had occurred there, and the material that I saw um, did not in any way um, lead me to take a different view um, from Lord Justice Holroyd and others. Um, that's paragraph 650 of your report you're referring to there. If we yes. turn to that on page 231. And if we scroll down, thank you. You say adopting the language. Uh, that's you adopting the language of the Court of Appeal. Yes. Um, when it considered the cases, it was improper for the post office to have made their acceptance of a plea to a lesser alternative offence conditional on a defendant not making any explicit criticism of um, Horizon. It, you say that it was improper um, of the post office, uh, but who within the post office had engaged in that improper conduct? Well, in, in the 
in each of those cases, there were um, documents that, are, that I saw that involved discussions um, between um, those in-house, so the, the, the lawyers and investigators, about effectively, again, the preconditions or the, the necessary conditions um, for there to be a plea accepted by reference to money and, and by reference to the reputation of Horizon. Thank you. So it's the lawyers on each occasion? Those are the persons whose emails I saw or memos I saw um, that identified those being the factors. Thank you. And then the last sentence of that paragraph, I think this is something that you've mentioned a moment ago, it would have been a relevant and likely strong mitigating factor um, that the falsification of records was to cover a shortfall for which the defendant was not responsible and may instead have been a computer error. To deny um, the defendant that mitigation was wrong. Can you just explain what you mean there, please? Well, it's um, on the one hand, um, someone who has um, dishonestly and, and deliberately manipulated the system, um, and on the other hand, someone who has um, been confronted by a an error in the system that they cannot understand, but which they do understand they, are, they will be held accountable for and made to pay for, um, and in panic has um, adjusted the system to stave off the day when they know that will be found out uh, on the other. Um, it is a significant potential difference as to how a judge will view their offending if they are, um, if it is a, a one-off result of panic through something beyond their control. A judge is much more likely to view that um, sympathetically and much more likely um, to consider that a custodial sentence is not required. And, and if they are prevented from advancing that mitigation, then they are being prevented from putting forward um, a strong argument for them not going to prison. Thank you. And then lastly, over the page, at paragraph 651. Uh, the Court of Appeal um, in Hamilton, it's there, paragraphs 113 and 147, said that it was irrational and unjust for the post office to have required the defendant to accept that they had the money short of theft. Um, and uh, the Court of Appeal observed that the post office's conduct gives a firm impression that the condition of repayment in return for the post office dropping the charge of theft placed undue pressure on Mrs Hamilton it gives the impression that the post office was using the prosecution to enforce repayment. Um, did you find any material that undermined the impression that the Court of Appeal uh, formed? No. Uh, the, the, the words um, that um, her plea would be accepted on her recognition that she had the money short of theft um, were words from the lawyer um, in the um, criminal law department at the post office. Uh, and again, and that was a discussion in advance of Ms. Hamilton, Mrs. Hamilton pleading to false accounting. And, and so on the one hand, you, you have an acceptance of a plea to um, adjusting um, records that revealed a loss rather than causing the loss in the sense of taking the money um, through the acceptance of false accounting rather than theft. And yet, um, it being a condition of that, that the individual in the criminal proceedings and be made liable for paying back money that they, you are accepting they have not taken. Um, that there may be a separate civil um, uh, discussion as to whether under the postmaster's contract they were required to make good a loss that they had not caused, but this is in the criminal um, uh, proceedings, making it a condition or pursuing criminal mechanisms in order to get money that you are accepting they have not taken. Thank you. Can we turn to topic 10? That can come down. Thank you. And the last topic is expert evidence. Um, can we start by way of um, uh, a recap of your previous evidence to the inquiry? Um, you said that a prosecutor intending um, to rely on expert evidence in criminal proceedings was during the relevant period uh, subject to the following obligations. And this is just by way of brief recap to the questions I'm going to ask. 
to satisfy themselves that the expert had been appropriately instructed, including by the provision of a detailed letter of instruction or email or terms of reference, uh, to provide the expert with instructions upon what it is that his or her opinion is sought, setting out the issues or questions that the expert is expected to address or to answer, to provide explicit guidance uh, as to what it is the expert is being asked to do and the material they're asked, being asked to consider in order to do it, to set out the material upon which reliance has been placed in the prosecution and which may be relevant to the questions that the expert is expected to answer, to inform the expert of their duties under the common law and the criminal procedure rules, to make sure that the expert not only understands their duties, uh, but that they had complied with the duties in order to ensure that the expert's evidence was admissible, and lastly, to satisfy themselves that any material or any literature of which the prosecutor was aware and which might undermine the expert's opinion was reviewed by the prosecution and disclosed to both the expert and to the defence. Yes. And those, the duties on the expert were, were well established before the inquiries period started. The, the um, responsibility of, of the person instructing an expert, the, the, the lawyers instructing an expert to communicate those duties to the expert to make sure the expert understood them um, evolved over the period of the inquiry but from quite early in the period it was again clear that that was what was required of them. Yes. Um, in the five case studies in which the post office obtained evidence from Mr Gareth Jenkins, that's um, Thomas, Misra, Allen, Sefton and Neild, and Ishak, yes. forgive the use of the surnames, did you identify any document or evidence that demonstrates that post office prosecutors or um, later um, those acting on their behalf from Cartwright King um, informed or instructed Mr. X, uh, Mr Jenkins about the duties of an expert? Uh, no. Uh, did you see any evidence that such prosecutors were themselves cognizant of the existence of any of these duties? No. And did you see any evidence that they complied with any of these obligations in their dealings with Mr Jenkins? No. Did you um, uh, see any in instructions to Mr Jenkins which might conform in any way with a written form of instruction that a prosecutor ought to provide to a person whom it is proposed to give expert witness no. evidence. In relation to um, the uh, evidence that Mr Jenkins himself gave, <coughs> you told us uh, previously about a case in 2006 and then the uh, criminal procedure uh, rules, uh, Rule 33, which came into force in November 2006, that there were a number of necessary inclusions in a, um, a report. Yes. So we've looked just now at duties on a prosecutor. We're now turning to duties on an expert themselves. Um, did they include, I'm going to summarise them all, Thank you. Um, details of the expert's academic and professional qualifications, experience and accreditation insofar as they're relevant to the opinions expressed? Yes. Uh, a statement setting out the substance of all of the instructions received, the questions upon which an opinion is sought, the materials that have been provided and considered, uh, assumptions which are material to the opinions expressed, um, information relating to who carried out any examinations or the methodology used, and if they weren't carried out by the expert themselves, um, the extent to which there was supervision, whether there was a range of opinion in the matters dealt with um, in the uh, report, a summary of that range of opinion, and the reasons for the opinion given, uh, relevant extracts of any literature or other material that might assist the court, and then finally a statement from the expert that they had understood and complied with their duty to the court to provide independent assistance by way of an objective and unbiased opinion. Yes. Were they the necessary inclusions in the report itself? Yes. In the five case studies that you have considered, uh, did you find that um, 
the witness statement served by Mr. Jenkins uh, set out any of those um, matters that I've mentioned that are necessary inclusions for an expert report or an expert statement? In most of his statements, he did set out um, his qualifications. Um, in some instances, or at least in one instance, um, uh, the, the, those who were um, receiving the statement from him, the lawyers at the post office, did ask him to do that. Um, to an extent, he set out the questions that he'd been asked in that he would identify what he was making the statement about, um, but he would not set out the details of what had been asked of him. Uh, he did not, I think, usually set out what materials he had been provided with or what sources of information he was relying upon. Um, insofar as that was the work of others beyond himself, that was not identified by him. Um, insofar as there was a range of opinions and or contrary um, views or material that was capable of undermining um, his opinions, that was not set out at all. Um, in terms of literature, um, which would uh, include expert reports that he had seen in earlier cases in relation to Horizon, and which would include his own expert reports in earlier um, proceedings. Those were not normally set out, uh, and there was never a statement um, identifying that he recognised the, the duties that were imposed upon him. Thank you. Um, did you see any evidence that the post office informed Mr Jenkins that the uh, printed statements should um, contain those necessary matters? No. Did you see any evidence that the post office and later um, lawyers at Cartwright King were aware that an expert report or an expert statement should contain those necessary inclusions? I, I never saw any material I, that I can think of that, that involved any discussion of that to tell me whether they appreciated that or not. They certainly didn't say they did. When you gave evidence on the last occasion, uh, you told us that even with those experts who were trained, accustomed and made their living, or at least in part made their living, from um, uh, gi uh, giving expert evidence, i.e. even if you were preaching to the choir, uh, a prosecutor had to make sure that the expert understood what their duties and obligations were. Is that right? Yes. And you emphasised that in relation to an expert who was not functionally independent of the prosecutor, that it was all the more important that they understood the nature of the role that an expert performs and that they properly understood what the requirement of independence actually entailed. Yes, and, and, and not least um, because the expert would need to demonstrate that independence and so they needed to be reminded to set out the basis upon which it was so demonstrated. Was Mr Jenkins one of those witnesses in respect of whom there was that heightened duty to um, ensure that they understood the nature of their expert duties and in particular what the requirement of independence entailed? Yes. Was that because he was not a professional expert witness? It, it, it was yes. It was because he he, he was um, giving evidence or something out with the knowledge of the jury, because it was something about which he had knowledge, because he worked for the people whose software it was. So his day-to-day -day work was a, as a software engineer um, or a computer engineer, uh, rather than a professional witness. Yes. Um, he wasn't, I think, you know, a member of any expert witness institute or similar. I say don't recall him listing any such membership. And would you agree that the heightened duty applied in particular because um, he was not independent of the subject matter of his evidence? He Absolutely. was in part speaking about um, his own work. Yes. His own work and the work of his employer. Um, and he wasn't, uh, would you agree, functionally independent of the prosecutor? No, because of the interrelation between the product that he was talking about um, and the application of that product by the prosecutor. Have you seen anything in the material um, to suggest that the post office or later uh, Cartwright King lawyers understood the heightened need to ensure that Mr Jenkins 
understood um, his duties as an expert, in particular the special need for um, independence and demonstrating independence? They, they, they understood the, the, um, um, how it might look um, in the sense that in the conversations that we looked at in emails leading up to the um, generic statement in 2012, there was um, discussion about whether it was it might be better to have someone independent of Fujitsu rather than working for Fujitsu delivering that statement. Um, that was as, as um, far as it went. So recognising the lack of independence, but then not taking the next step, what do we do to address it? Yes. Before we look at any um, of the communications lawyers had with Mr Jenkins, did you observe that some of them, um, and this is communications between lawyers and investigators on the one hand and Mr Jenkins on the other, were inconsistent with how a prosecutor ought to um, address and to communicate with an expert? Yes, and I should say that I have seen a, a lot more in terms of communications between um, those at the post office on the one hand and Ms Jenkins on the other within the last week that yes. I had before. Um, I, I, that which I had seen before um, was a cause for concern. That which I have seen since heightened those concerns considerably. It, it, can I um, summarise them? Did you find that there was a... Um, a lack of formality in the communications? Yes. Did you find um, the guidance given to him to be adequate or inadequate? Um, inadequate. Did you find uh, some of the language used to be appropriate or inappropriate? Inappropriate. And did you find that um, whether any of the instructions given had as their intent the service of the post office's interests rather than the provision of an independent opinion? Yes. As well as some of the um, communications being inconsistent with the um, way a prosecutor ought to approach an expert, did you find any of them to be the opposite of that, i.e. the antithesis to it? Yes. If it's right that the post office um, or its agents, Carl Cartwright King later, did not provide Mr Jenkins with written instructions that conform to the requirements that we've mentioned, um, didn't provide Mr Jenkins with instructions as to his duties as an expert, and none of the statements included the necessary elements that um, we've identified, Would you be able to draw an overall conclusion that there was a fundamental failure by the post office properly to instruct Mr Jenkins as an expert? Clearly, that, that's ultimately a, a conclusion for others than me, but certainly um, it, it, it is not a conclusion from which I would dissent at all. <coughs> and with the limitation you've just included, was that a persistent failure? Yes. You told us back in your first report, it was paragraph 67, and no need to turn it up, that there was, um, a, quote, a no prosecution document that I have seen that gave guidance as to what an expert being instructed uh, needed to address. No post office document. No. Yes, no post office document. Yes. Was the, uh, that absence of a, um, a framework within prosecution policy reflected in the post office's practice as you saw it in the case of Mr Jenkins? Yes. The things we've spoken about so far were failures of omission, things that the post office didn't do or its lawyers did not do. Did you identify any material in the five case studies that prosecutors and investigators communicated with Mr Jenkins that were inconsistent with the approach that a prosecutor ought to take. So work worse than mere failure. But the, the, um, some of the emails that we considered yesterday where on, on the face of them they were telling 
the expert what to say um, and, and telling him what not to say. Um, that, I think, goes beyond an omission. Um, in material that I've seen, again, since the end of last week, uh, there, there are examples of um, Mr Jenkins' statements being rewritten by um, investigators and lawyers at the post office in the sense of them saying, can you take that bit out, please, or that bit doesn't sound good, can you say something else? Um, and this is in relation to the evidence of an independent expert. That is, that is the role that Mr Jenkins was being advanced um, to perform. And whilst it is entirely right um, and proper for, for an investigator or prosecutor dealing with an expert to say, I don't understand that paragraph, can you elucidate it? Or um, can you think about this section um, in the light of this or that that you haven't seen or this or that that you say further down? Um, that is different from saying that bit um, is going to give rise to disclosure issues or that bit is going to cause us problems, can you take it out? Or just deleting it in the way that they did from his yes. draft. Sometimes they wrote, um, can you do X, can you delete, um, can you add, can you rephrase? And sometimes they simply cut it out. Yes. And the issues that you identified um, where uh, the evidence was amended, uh, deleted or tailored in that way, uh, did they go to horizon integrity issues? Absolutely. How um, serious, in your view, was this conduct? Extremely. Did any of the um, issues that we've identified so far go to the admissibility of Mr Jenkins' evidence? They, they um, <laughs> by, for example, removing um, aspects of his statements which were parts that qualified his opinion or identified contrary views to his opinion. They, they um, resulted in those, the final versions of the statements no longer complying with the requirements for a, an admissible expert statement. And, and um, they also, in, in various respects, um, removed um, the independence of its content. And so, yes, they, they clearly affected its admissibility. Had, had that, any of that been appreciated by anyone who had the opportunity to question its admissibility? Uh, and in order to put that person in a position to do so, disclosure of the communications would have been necessary? Yes. Did you see any evidence at all that such communications between investigator and lawyer uh, on the one hand and Mr Jenkins on the other were disclosed in any of the five cases? No. Did you see any um, evidence of any uh, formal request from the post office to Fujitsu for third party disclosure about the matters that Mr Jenkins was referring to? Um, so to take an example, the locking issue, which caused transactions to be lost, or the record of system errors, the known error log. Did you see any communications at that level? No. And did you see anything to suggest that the post office pursued such issues with the uh, Fujitsu head of legal, um, despite on occasions that channel of communication being used? I can't think of any, no. Thank you. Can I turn then, that's the 10 topics over, to the case studies? Uh, your um, reports address 22 case studies and your evidence speak, speaks for itself. It's been disclosed to all core participants and is available on the inquiry's website. Um, I'm not going to go through each of the 22 case studies and instead only cover those where one of the core participants has asked me to ask questions of you by way of challenge to yes. what you say, um, or where one of the core participants has asked for additional context to be given to what you do say in either of your reports. Can I start then with um, Lisa Brennan? Uh, this is paragraph 46 of your um, volume 2 report, which is on page 24. There's no need to, to turn it up for the moment. 
in general terms, you there um, are critical of the failure to conduct a fuller financial investigation as to uh, any financial benefit to Ms. Brennan of the conduct that was alleged against her. Yes. Yeah. Um, as you said yesterday, investigating a suspect's financial records was a reasonable line of inquiry. Yes. During a, uh, the period 2000 to 2013, would um, ordinary theft and fraud cases be prosecuted um, in the public sector, e.g. by the police and the CPS, without any inquiry of this uh, sort having taken place? Uh, I'm sure there will have been some, um, but certainly my experience he, he, he is that um, <clears throat> follow the money is a, is a, um, a mantra, um, those dealing with any form of financial crime, and, and so they would um, normally look. Because if they found the evidence of, of the money, for example, going into someone's bank account, that would be quite good evidence. Yes, so you'd want to do it as a prosecutor, trying to prove your case. Absolutely. But you ought to do it, I think you told us yesterday, as a reasonable line of inquiry, because it might assist the defendant too. Yes. Because an active um, and um, healthy uh, financial um, investigation, uh, which produced nil returns, uh, it might be uh, powerful evidence for a defendant to be able to deploy. Yes, especially if... Um they have, in interview, said in terms, I didn't take the money. Um, that raises the reasonable line of inquiry of, well, did they? Uh, and the, the obvious place to look is to see whether they've got it. And, and whether that be um, a new speedboat or money in the bank, you have a look. Was it usual in that period, 2000 to 2013, for charging decisions to be made in cases prosecuted by the CPS whilst financial inquiries were outstanding, if it was nonetheless the case that there was sufficient evidence to provide a realistic prospect of conviction? That would be a, a fact-specific assessment in terms of um, where the financial inquiry was and what um, material had thus far been generated by it. But clearly, if there was um, if a prosecutor was satisfied, despite the fact that the financial inquiry was ongoing, that there was a realistic prospect of conviction, um, then they would be entitled to reach an assessment, providing they were also satisfied that what was outstanding didn't have a bearing on the public interest assessment. I think you would agree that it's um, in a charge of theft, it's sufficient to prove um, the, fact, the fact of the theft whether by direct evidence or circumstantial evidence, without also, in fact, being able to show where the money went. Yes. Was your um, experience in looking at these papers that such financial inquiries that were made had as their focus not proving or disproving um, uh, theft, but recovery of proceeds for the benefit of the post office? Yes, in some cases it wasn't very clear um, what they had um, made the financial inquiries that they did make um, um, for, um, but because um, there would be a reference in an investigation report to the fact that they'd asked the postmaster for consent to access their bank account, they'd obtained that consent, they may have obtained some bank statements, and then there'd be no further reference to them, um, and so it wasn't quite clear what they'd done with them. Um, but. Uh, where um, there was more intensive examination of the finances, it did appear to be by financial investigators preparing for confiscation rather than investigators preparing for prosecution. Would you agree that in the context of a fraud involving the alleged theft of cash of the type um, alleged in uh, Lisa Brennan's case, that the absence of evidence of her having the missing money could not exclude the possibility that she did, in fact, take the cash? It couldn't exclude it, no. Given that the case was left to the jury on the basis uh, that there was no evidence of her having the money, how, in your view, could an investigation of her finances by the post office have placed her in a more advantageous position than she was either at the point of the charging decision or 
uh, before the jury. Uh, only that if it could have confirmed that they had looked and not found any evidence that she had benefited financially and, and or confirmed that she, um, if this were the case, had made, attempted to make repayments at an earlier stage of losses and or if it confirmed that she was not in a position where she needed to steal um, the money, those things would have further supported her case, not least because they were coming from the prosecution rather than, for example, just from her. Thank you. Um, that, that's all um, I ask in relation to Lisa Brennan's case. Um, I'm going to move over the cases of David Yates, um, David Blakey and Tahir Mahmood and turn to the case of Carl Page and in particular your consideration of his case um, at page 58, paragraph 146 to 148 of your report. Uh, page 58, please. And paragraph 146. And between paragraphs 146 and 148, you raise some criticisms based on your understanding, I think from the Court of Appeal Criminal Division's judgment in Hamilton, that the prosecution had changed its case between the first and the second trial. Yes. Um, the inquiry has heard some evidence um, since the Court of Appeal's decision from Warwick Tatford, the uh, prosecution junior to uh, Mr. Stephen John at the first trial and sole prosecuting counsel at the second trial. Uh, he's told the inquiry that there were two counts in trial one. The first count was an alleged conspiracy to defraud between Mr. Page and Mr. Whitehouse in relation to foreign currency uh, involving the use of a Ford, F-O-R-D-E, money changer, yes. and not Horizon, and a second count of theft of £282,000 alleged against Mr. Page alone based on an audit shortfall and therefore based on Horizon. Uh, both defendants were acquitted on count one at the first trial, jury unable to reach a verdict on count one at the first trial. Therefore, there was a retrial on count two alone yes. against uh, Mr. Page. And that as such, the second trial uh, was a retrial and did not involve a change of case. Was your conclusion that there had been a change of case based on what the Court of Appeal Criminal Division had said in Hamilton? In part. Um, also based on the assessment in the second site review, which was to the same effect. Uh, that's um, paragraph 147 that you're, it refer is. you're referring yes. to there. Uh, other than those um, tertiary so sources um, uh, or secondary sources, did you see anything in the contemporaneous papers to suggest that there had been a material change of case between the two trials? I, I saw a transcript of the evidence of, or more particularly the cross-examination of Mr Page at the first trial, which was very much to the effect that, that um, he had stolen foreign currency uh, and that that was the basis upon which the theft charge appeared to be presented there, which was how Second Sight characterised it in their review. So there was that material, that um, contemporaneous material, that accorded with what they were saying had been the prosecution's case at the first trial, which was not its case at the second trial. I can't, on the top of my head, remember anything else, but um, I didn't see anything equally um, that would positively say that the case had not changed in the sense of a review between trial one and trial two as to how the case would now be put in the light of the acquittal on count one first time round. Uh, does anything that I have said in relation to what Mr Tapford has told um, the chair um, change your view in relation to this aspect of the case against Char Carl Page? Uh, clearly, I, I haven't considered what Mr Tapford had to say. All, all I can say is that the material that I saw, and I can only speak to that, um, didn't cause me to take a different view to either Second Sight um, or more pertinently, the Court of Appeal, as to the fact that there had been a change of case. Thank you. Can I turn to um, Oyeteju Adedeo's case, please? 
um, you uh, pick this up, um, page 66 of your report, paragraph yes. 169 and following. And I think amongst the material that you've seen um, uh, since the preparation of your original report and this revised report um, included um, the CCRC referral document. Yes. Uh, the reference to which we needn't display it is poll 0012-1224. Uh, did your view remain that the case was poorly investigated? Yes. Uh, did your, case, uh, did your um, view remain that, in particular, uh, Mrs. Adadeo's account was not explored or examined by the investigators or the prosecutors? Yes, and, and in that regard, um, I focus on the account that she gave at the time. I, I've seen what, what she has said about that since, but I focus purely on what she gave as the explanation to the investigators at the time, which was an, invest, uh, an account that required investigating. Was it incumbent upon the investigator, uh, Miss uh, Bernard, to investigate that account to see, for example, whether there had been any payments to third parties by Miss Adadeo? Yes. And would that have been a relatively straightforward exercise? I would have thought so. I'm not a financial investigator, but yes, I'd have thought so. Uh, did you read the um, transcript of the interview of um, Mrs. Adadeo? Yes. Um, I wonder whether we can do this without turning it, it up. Uh, would you agree or disagree with the suggestion that when asked open questions, Miss, um, Mrs. Adadeo appeared um, incoherent in some of her answers? They weren't easy to follow. Did you find that the um, account that was ultimately attributed to her in the investigating officer's report was one that had been extracted through closed questions to her? Yes, I think that's a fair catch characterization. There, were, there was, um, when open questions were asked, um, initially the, the account she gave was, was not clear and more uh, and or closed questions were then asked um, from which a clearer account um, was derived, but clearly they were a, it was a clearer account based on what she was agreeing with. Would you agree or disagree with the suggestion that the account overall was internally inconsistent and confusing? I, I can certainly um, understand why that would be suggested, yes. When she gave evidence to us, um, the investigator, um, Natasha Bernard, um, said that she viewed it as inconsistent and confusing. And she says that she said that uh, it's quite clear from her report that she didn't believe what Mrs. Adadeo was telling her. In certain respects, yes, I agree with that. Given that um, the equivocal nature of what was being said, uh, would you agree that that added an impetus for the case uh, to be properly investigated? Yes. There wasn't any um, clear evidence of a theft and uh, a contradictory or internally inconsistent, in some respects baffling, confession? Yes. Would that have been a questionable basis to prosecute? Without that being resolved, yes. Um, if we look at paragraph 181 <coughs> of your report, please, which is on page 70. At last sentence, in the light of what you said earlier in paragraph 181, um, in Mrs. Adadeo's case, Horizon reliability was not an issue and non-disclosure relating to the operation of Horizon potentially less of an issue as a result. Are you there um, essentially adopting the same approach as the Court of Appeal Criminal Division? Yes, I hope so. Thank you very much. Can we turn to um, Mr. Thomas's case next, please? Before you do, Mr. Beer, um, can I just understand what went on in Mrs. Adedale's case? Um, 
her conviction was quashed by the Southern Crown Court. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. So uh, this, this is purely technical, um, but where you write that she pleaded guilty at the Crown Court, I don't think can be right, can it? Uh, uh, presumably what happened, she pleaded guilty at the Magistrates Court but was then committed for sentence. That must be right, yes, sir. That yeah, right. right. That's just a mere technicality. But what's of more interest in her case is that there's no real rationale, is there, in, in how her conviction was quashed or why it was quashed because we haven't got a, a formal judgment of the Southern Crown Court. Is that correct? We, we have a transcript of the hearing at which it was indicated by counsel acting for the post office that although they didn't accept um, the reasons that had been advanced on Mrs Adadeo's behalf for why her conviction should be quashed, they nevertheless considered that it would be contrary to the public interest to seek to uphold her conviction, and so they didn't oppose her appeal. Um, there was no judgment given, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong about it, so no judgment was given by the uh, Recorder of Westminster who presided over that hearing separate from that. Um, but, uh, and so um, the, the transcript is, is, is less than helpful as to exactly why it came about um, that um, Mrs Adadeo's um, conviction was quashed. Certainly the post office made clear they didn't accept um, a good deal of what Mrs Adadeo's case as considered by the Criminal Cases Review Commission had been. But, so in effect, at court, the, the, there was a, a, an issue which was unresolved by the judge. Mrs Adadeo's case was presented in a particular way. The post office said what you just described to me, and the judge didn't determine the issue between them. No, that's right, sir. So am I right in thinking that the only objective, by which I mean independent of Mrs Adadeo or the post office, assessment is that which we currently have, is that which is contained in the reference by the Criminal Review Commission? Yes. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Beer, I wanted to be clear in my mind about this case. Yes, thank you. I think the, the document that you saw was a transcript of the um, hearing at Southwark um, Crown Court in front of Her Honour Judge Taylor. Yes. Of the 14th of May 2021. And that ends, um, the hearing starts at 10.47. Do you want to just have a look at it? Where I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be able to. Dis I'm going to be able to display this. So I think it's um, volume one of the Rule 10 material at tab D32. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Is, is that the relevant transcript? It is. Yes. Um, the hearing starts. We can see on page two um, at 10:47. And uh, Miss Carey, I think that's Jacqueline Carey, appears on behalf of the prosecution and speaks um, over um, pages two, three, and four. And then Mr. Maloney, who appeared for both appellants. Yes. Uh, says a few words, ten words or so. Yes, he was largely inaudible, apparently. Yes, um, which is no doubt due to the recording rather than Mr Maloney. I'm sure. Um, there's then a discussion or something that Judge, Her Honour Judge Taylor said which concerns jurisdiction. Yes, the, the, because um, Mrs. Adadeo had pleaded guilty um, in the, and, and, and so you're entirely right, so he pleaded guilty in the Medway Magistrates Court to the offences um, and was then um, sent to the Crown Court, the Maidstone Crown Court, for sentence. And, and so procedurally, um, 
her guilty pleas had to be set aside before her conviction could be quashed. And so that's the discussion at the end. And then the hearing concludes with this. Judge Taylor saying thank you. In these appeals of Mr. Caria and Ms. Adedeo, the court finds that the effects of Section 1124 of the Criminal Appeal Act 1985 are such that they do not have to apply to set aside their guilty pleas. We adopt the background inaudible to these cases, which is set out in Hamilton against the post office, and the citation is given. Whilst it is not conceded that the, uh, by the post office that these are uh, inaudible cases, in terms of judgment, the appeals are not opposed, inaudible, will not be contested, and in the public interest, inaudible. Their sentences have been served, and we hope that, inaudible, they can put this behind them and continue with their lives without the shadow of a conviction. Any other applications? Um, Miss, it says Mr. Carey. Yes. Um, it should be Miss Carey. Yes. Um, and she says no, thank you. Um, is that the extent of a, um, a judgment determining the appeal? Yes, it is. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can we turn on to um, um, Mr. Thomas's case uh, then, please? Uh, this is um, paragraph um, 198 and following of your report um, on page um, 76. Um, in fact, we needn't turn this up. I can deal with this um, without looking at this material. In paragraphs 193, 198, and 213 uh, of your report, in the context of Mr. Thomas's case, you um, examine the preparation of a witness statement by um, Gareth, uh, Gareth Jenkins. Yes, I think the first witness statement he made. Exactly. Um, you say um, at paragraph 198 uh, that consideration of the reference material, i.e. material that was referenced in um, the Gareth um, at Jenkins chronology is necessary. We mentioned the uh, nature and um, status of that document yesterday. Yes, that's right. So can we look um, at the reference material and indeed some other material, underlying material, uh, in chronological order? Can we start, please, with um, FUJ 2203 And can we look at page six, please? And if we scroll down, please, we should see an email that we can from, um, if we just scroll up a little bit, thank you, from Graham Ward um, to, and it's a generic email account, to Fujitsu of the 10th of March, 2006. Uh, this appears to be the original um, or originated, originating form of instruction from Mr. Ward of the post office to Fujitsu. And if we just scroll down, please, and go on to page seven. He says, on a separate matter, I also require a witness statement in respect of the following ARQs, all of which relate to the Garwin SPSO. That's Mr. Thomas's branch on Ang yes, right. Anglesey. We need the usual leave out paragraphs H, B, and J, but we, knew, we do need paragraph K, call logs, covering an analysis over the period 11th of January 04 <coughs> to the 30, 30th of November 05. And then, Penny, you may recall this one, which relates to nil transactions. Uh, can you add an extra paragraph in your statement 
explaining how online banking transactions are processed and the data downloaded and how nil transactions can occur. If we go forward, so that's the 10th of May, post office ward to Fujitsu. Yes. Um, if we go forwards, please, to the 21st of March, FUJ 0015-2582. And look at page two, please. If we scroll down. Thank you. We should see an email from um, Mr. Um, Pinder to Mr. Jenkins uh, with a heading Fujitsu statements at Darwin. Uh, as discussed, please see extract from a recent email below in italics from Graham Ward. We've just looked at that email. Yes. Regarding provision um, of a statement about nil transactions and online banking. If they're able to put something together for us, I'd be very grateful. If um, you send it back, I'll arrange for um, Nana or Penny to write into a statement for your signature. Um, and then you'll see the relevant part of Mr. Ward's email cut in to this email and the part in italics. Um, can you add an extra paragraph in your statement explaining how online banking transactions are processed and the data downloaded and how nil transactions can occur? Uh, having looked at this um, material, um, uh, do you um, agree that it was the post office via Mr. Ward, routed through Mr. Pinder, who had asked Mr. Jenkins to focus on the issue of nil transactions in the witness statement? Yes. Uh, rather than a request to consider any broader issue affecting the operation and reliability of Horizon? Yes. Would you agree um, you'll see the reference to the three ARQs in the first um, line of the cut-in email? I'm not going to read the numbers out. That it was the post office which had selected the three specific time periods for the examination of nil transactions, and that it had done so by enclosing ARQs for time periods that it had selected? Yes. Would you agree that the, um, this instruction to Mr. Jenkins didn't constitute um, or indeed come close to being a proper instruction to an expert? Yes. Instead, it, it's a request coming from the post office to the Fujitsu litigation support team asking them to add a paragraph to their standard statement, which was then rerouted to Mr. Jenkins. That was how I read it, yes. Quite aside from the format of the um, uh, instruction, is it right that um, you saw no material in which the post office provided to Mr Jenkins detail as to what the prosecution case was against Mr Thomas? That's right. Um, no material setting out what Mr. Thomas had said, for example, in interview Correct. or uh, in uh, the audit and in the audit report. Yes. And there was no analysis for him of the competing issues between the parties. No, that's right. Would you agree that um, on these materials that Mr. Jenkins wasn't in fact instructed to undertake an examination of the scheme? Yes, I agree. Of the system? Yes. Thank you very much. So, um, it's just gone hubbust um, 11 now. I wonder whether we could break until quarter to 12. Yes, certainly, yeah. Thank you.
Uh, so good morning. Can you continue to see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Uh, before I continue with um, uh, the chronology in Mr. Thomas's case, can we just return um, to uh, Ms. Adedeo's case and mm -hmm. just um, clarify a couple of points in the light of the questions you asked and the evidence that Mr. Um, Atkinson gave? Can we start, please, Mr. Atkinson, um, just by explaining the different nature of appeals from the Crown Court to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division and from a Magistrates Court to a Crown Court yes. in CCRC reference cases. Is it right that an appeal from the Crown Court to the CCAD um, it, uh, it is um, essentially a review of the safety of the conviction? Yes. Whereas if a person has pleaded guilty in the Magistrates Court, um, uh, there is no power to appeal um, unless the CCRC make a reference. Yes. If the CCRC make a reference, um, the test um, that the CCRC apply is uh, not whether the conviction is unsafe, but whether it's arguable that it might be. Yes. Um, if the CCRC um, uh, do make a reference to the Crown Court on a case involving a plea in the Magistrates Court, that results in um, a hearing de novo. Yes, and, and, and so a rehearing of, of the case. Yes, so essentially a retrial. Yes. A rehearing of the case. Yes. And upon such rehearing of the case, the prosecutor must um, or ought to consider both limbs of the code test at that point in time. Yes. Um, what happened in Miss Adedeo's case was that the post office made a concession um, on the public interest limb of the test, as explained by Ms. Carey um, in the transcript, uh, that that limb was not at that point satisfied. That's right. Uh, that um, approach by the post office meant that um, Mrs. Adedeo did not have the opportunity to argue by reference to the evidence and to make submissions um, whether the evidential um, threshold was met. That, that wouldn't be... Um, for the court anyway, but to argue in court um, by reference to evidence as to whether her case was an Horizon case or not. No, that's right. Is that why we don't see a judgment um, from uh, Her Honour Judge Taylor um, resolving whether um, Mrs Adedeo's um, case was or was not an Horizon case because essentially the post office offered no evidence against her, and there was nothing for her then to do. And there had been no submissions before um, Judge Taylor on that issue, which would have allowed her to come to a view? No, save that I think in the inaudible part of the transcript, um, it's agreed between the post office and Mr Maloney that what was said was that the post office analysis that this was not a, an horizon case was not accepted, and he was essentially preserving his position and her position for the future. Yes. Thank you. Can we go back to um, uh, Mr. Thomas's case, please? Yes. Uh, can we look in the uh, next step of the chronology at FUJ 2587? And page five, please. We'd previously been looking at the 10th of March and the 21st of March. We're now looking at the 22nd of March. And if we scroll down a little bit, please. We see Mr. Ward, just scroll up slightly. Mr. Ward emailing um, at the uh, Fujitsu employees that we see set out, uh, confirming in the second paragraph that the post office required a witness statement producing ARQ extracts um, in spreadsheet form relating to Mr. Thomas's post office and um, a statement explaining uh, the headings and under what circumstances nil transactions can occur. Can you see that in the second paragraph? Yes. 
And then if we scroll up, please, uh, to the top of page five. Uh, we see um, Miss Lowther providing Mr. Ward with a draft witness statement later that day on the 22nd of um, March. Please see the draft witness statement for the above um, re-nil transactions. Does this meet your requirements? And then um, the page above, please, page four. A reply from Mr. Ward later that day, the 22nd. Um, in the third paragraph, um, second line, I'm concerned at the words system failure, which is also in an earlier line. There has been some sort of fit system failure. What does this mean exactly? And is there any indication of a system failure at this office during the period in question? Uh, can we go forwards, please, to FUJ 0012-2203? And page three, please. Um, on that day, uh, 22nd of March, uh, Miss Lowther forwards Graham Ward's email to Mr Jenkins. Hi, Gareth. Please see reply below uh, from Graham regarding your statement. <coughs> Ignore the first bit. And then please can you look at his second paragraph and advise with your comments. Again, I've attached a draft copy of your um, uh, statement. And then if we go up to page one, please. Uh, reply later um, the next day, the 23rd. Um, Mr. Jenkins sending a revised witness statement saying, in particular, I feel, I don't feel I can include the last two paragraphs which may make the statement useless. Can we look at what that attachment was? Uh, FUJ 0012-2204. 23rd of March, that draft statement, scroll down, please. Um, you'll see the introduction and then the part of the text in um, single line spacing there are three main reasons why a zero transaction may be generated as part of the banking system one and two and then three there has been some sort of system failure such failures are normal occurrences And so the point remains in <coughs> Mr. Jenkins' statement in this draft, despite Mr. Ward's questions expressed to Ms. Lowther and passed on to Mr. Jenkins. Why is that <coughs> there? What does it mean? Yes. So he's maintaining that reasons why a zero transaction may be generated include some sort of system failure and that they are normal occurrences. Uh, can we go um, to FUJ 0012-2203? So I'm so sorry. Um, if we can go to the third page of the witness statement, please. And if we scroll down just a little bit, you'll remember that in his covering email, Mr. Jenkins um, said that I don't think I can say um, the part in the last two paragraphs, and these are the last two paragraphs in the statement. Um, no reason to believe the information in the statement is inaccurate. 
to, believe, to the best of my knowledge and belief at all times, the computer was operating properly. And then a records declaration. And then Mr. Uh, Jenkins said, as well as in his email, at the foot of the page, I'm not sure that the yellow bit is true. Can this be deleted? All I've done is interpret the data in spreadsheets that you have emailed me. Just pausing here for the moment, in relation to the page one point, system failures being a reason for nil transactions and being normal occurrences in the system, would you agree that it wasn't appropriate for the post officer, uh, post officers, an investigator, or as a prosecutor, to insist upon the removal of any references to system failures from Mr. Jenkins' witness statements? Yes, I, 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 the emails that we've just seen. I don't think there was anything um, inappropriate about them asking what he meant by that, or asking him to explain that further. But asking him to remove it um, is a different matter. The, um, to the extent that it was removed subsequently, do you agree that Mr. Jenkins' recognition in this draft of his witness statement that system failures are normal occurrences in the system ought properly to have been disclosed in this prosecution? Yes. And in others? Yes. Um, with, with more information as to what he meant by that. And no matter what went on um, subsequently in terms of the deletion of that line from his witness statement, should that have been material disclosed by Mr Jenkins himself? Um, it, it, it should, if it was his um, view, if it was part of his expert um, assessment, it should have stayed there um, and um, formed a part of, of what he produced. Do you agree that Mr Jenkins request that the last paragraphs, the two that we're looking at, be removed from the draft witness statement uh, to um, ought to have been disclosed in this prosecution? If the two paragraphs remained in the statement as ultimately served, then the fact that he didn't agree with them clearly needed to be... I mean, that's yeah. what happens. Um, despite his request for their removal, we'll see that it eventually, in the statement of the 6th of April 2006, those paragraphs remained. Without qualification? Yes. Yeah. And therefore, um, his um, unhappiness at including those two paragraphs in a statement ought properly to have been disclosed in this prosecution? Yes. And in other prosecutions? Um, in any prosecution where this statement was served and, and, and or disclosed um, or those um, paragraphs were included in any further statement that was served or disclosed, then his um, disagreement with needed to be disclosed as well. Uh, can we go please to FUJ 0012 2210? And just look at the bottom of page one, please. Um, from Miss Lowther to Mr. Ward. Hi, Graham. Please see attached draft, second draft for the above, with further explanation regarding the issues you raised. That second draft is the one that we've just looked at. Um, please let me know of any amendments as soon as possible, as we need to put this in the post, etc. And then further up on page one, later the same day on the 24th, Mr. Ward replies at 11.37, uh, Nana, this statement needs more work. I've attached a suggested draft with a number of comments. As mentioned previously, I think that's the previous email that we just looked at, I think the, quote, system failure normal occurrence line is potentially very damaging. It may be worth considering someone from our team taking a statement directly from Gareth. Where is he based? 
whilst there's some urgency with this, it's more important to get it right and ensure we're not embarrassed at court, which we certainly could be if we produce the statement accepting, quote, system failures are normal occurrences. Let me know what you think of the um, draft. And then if we see at the top of the page there, um, later that day, that's passed that email directly by Miss Lowther to um, Gareth Jenkins. Please see email below and the new draft statement. So let's look at Mr. Um, Ward's um, drafting efforts. Uh, poll 3047895. If we scroll down, please. And again. And again. And again. And again. No, just, sorry, scroll up a bit more. A little bit more, thank you. Yeah, so this is the relevant paragraph at the top of the page here. Um, there are three, and then Mr Ward has inserted, if these are the main reasons, what are the rest? Uh, reasons why a zero value transaction may be generated as part of the banking system. And then I think one and two remain the same. The third reason, system failure, has been deleted. Can you see that? Yes. And replaced by Mr. Ward's uh, typing. Uh, this is a really poor choice of words, which seems to accept that failures in the system are normal and therefore may well support the postmaster's claim that the system is to blame for the losses for exclamation marks. Do you consider this type of intervention in relation to the content of Mr Jenkins' um, evidence to be appropriate conduct by a member of a prosecuting authority? No. Do you consider the degree of input into the drafting of Mr Jenkins' witness statement to be appropriate if it was the case that Mr Jenkins was being treated as an expert witness? No, there was, as I said before, there was no issue with Mr Ward, as he had in earlier emails, asking what um, system failures meant and having a better understanding of that. But to um, take it out because it was embarrassing or damaging um, or would help the postman, the defendant, the help the defendant um, it, it is very much the, the opposite of what they should have been doing. Do you agree that um, to the extent that an investigator or a manager of investigators had made deletions or proposed deletions to a witness statement and had given as a reason that the evidence that the expert was proposing to give might well support the defendant and therefore the word should be deleted ought to have been disclosed in the prosecution? shouldn't have happened, and if it did happen, it should have been disclosed. Can we go to page three, please? <clears throat> Can we see that the um, two paragraphs in relation to uh, the operation of the computer, and we'll come back in a moment to exactly what they may have meant, what their, their focus may have been in a moment, but they have been um, removed by Mr Ward yes. in this draft. Again, was that um, proper conduct by a member of the prosecuting authority? It would depend on why it was done and what else was done in relation to it. If um, clearly, if the person whose statement this was said that they were that they wanted those paragraphs to be deleted because they were wrong, um, then it was not wrong to delete those paragraphs, but uh, it, it should have generated discussion as to why they were wrong or what the issue was. And if the issue was, as I read Mr Jenkins' email to suggest, that um, for him to attest as to the operation of the system, he needed more material than he had been given, then the discussion needs to be about that rather than 
just deleting the paragraphs and, and moving on as if nothing had happened. Thank you. Uh, can we move on, please, to poll uh, 0012 2217? FUJ 0012 Did I say poll? Yeah. My mistake. I said poll rather than FUJ. FUJ 0012 And can we start with page two, please? Uh, we can see that. Um, Mr. Ward's amendments to the second draft of the statement are um, sent back to uh, Mr. Jenkins. And then if we go up, please. Uh, sorry, up again. Mr. Um, Jenkins emails um, Mr. Ward directly copying Ms. Lowther in an updated draft statement saying, I've added some further annotations to your annotations. Does this move us forward? So should we see what the attachment said? FUJ 0012 2218. This is the um, attachment to that email. Although it was being sent on the 28th of March, the statement remained dated the 24th of March. And if we scroll down, please, and scroll down, and again, and again, and again, and again, and stop, you'll see the third reason system failures remains deleted. You'll see. Uh, Mr. Ward's annotations of really poor choice of words, and you'll see Mr. Jenkins' reply. Please, can you suggest something better then? What we have here are genuine failures of the end-to-end -end system, which are not part of normal operation, but are anticipated and the system's designed to cope with them. Some such failures could be engineered as part of a malicious attack. That doesn't apply to those failures that appear in the evidence presented. In all cases, the system's designed to identify such failures and handle them in a way that the customer, postmaster, post office, and the um, financial investigators are all clear as to the status of the transaction and then any necessary financial reconciliation take pl takes place. I guess one option is to delete over the page the paragraph since it is purely an introduction to the following more detailed um, uh, description. So Mr. Jenkins has asked Mr. Ward to suggest something better and raise the possibility of deleting the paragraph. In the light of the fact that Mr. Jenkins uh, recognized in this further um, draft or the response to the proposed amendment do you uh, that system failures were anticipated? Was it a, appropriate for the post office as an investigator or prosecutor uh, to insist upon the removal of the reference to system failures from the witness statement? No. What, what was necessary was for them to provide a proper explanation of what that meant. and the recognition in the text that he added that such system failures were anticipated, um, do you agree ought properly to have been disclosed in the prosecution? Yes. If we go over the page, please. So if we scroll down. you 
you'll see that the um, system operation paragraphs, those two paragraphs at the end that were in the original colored um, uh, yellow, um, remain uh, removed. Yes. Do you agree that um, this draft of the witness statement ought properly to have been disclosed in the prosecution? Yes. Can we go forward to FUJ 2587? Mr. Ward um, emails Mr. Pinder copying um, Ms. Lowther and Mr. Jenkins in, saying, I don't understand why this statement is taking so long to be put together. I appreciate it's slightly unusual, but I don't understand the confusion, as I thought I'd made our requirements um, uh, clear. Uh, remember the word requirements, um, if you may. Um, unfortunately, Gareth's annotations do not take us forward at all. I'm sure this is not Gareth's fault. Gareth indicated in the attachment below that three spreadsheets produced by your team were not produced by him, and therefore, as he quite rightly points out, he is not in a position to produce them in his statement. That, that, that's a side point. And then scroll down, please. As already stated, we urgently need a statement producing these three additional spreadsheets, explaining in general terms under what circumstances nil transactions occur, and in particular how the nil transactions at Garwin occurred. The same statement needs to include a paragraph which states that there is no evidence of a system error at Garwin, assuming this is the case, in relation to nil transactions at the office. We do not need to mention system failures being normal occurrences if there's no evidence of such a problem at this office. Um, it may now be best if the investigator arranges to meet with Gareth to take the statement in person. Do you consider this intervention uh, by Mr Ward to be appropriate conduct by a member of a prosecuting authority? No. Do you consider uh, uh, whether the, uh, do you consider the degree of input into the drafting of this witness statement to be appropriate? No. Ought this um, exchange to have been disclosed in the prosecution? Yes, especially if the statement was being relied upon. <coughs> um, no need to turn them up, but some evidence the inquiry has got, um, FUJ 00155721 and FUJ 0015 <coughs> 2592 suggests that um, Mr. Pinder, the Fujitsu, then spoke with Miss Matthews, the investigator, and arranged for her to meet Mr. Jenkins in person on the um, 6th of April 2006 to, quote, record the statement. And it appears um, as a result of that meeting, an updated draft witness statement was prepared dated the 6th of April 2006. If we can look at that, please. FUJ 0012-2237. Uh, if we scroll down, please. And again, and again, and again, and again, and keep scrolling. And again, now if we just scroll back up, please. You'll see, I think, that the three main reasons for nil transactions uh, occurring, including system um, generated uh, occurrences, uh, do not appear in this final witness statement nor any reference to system failures at all. That's right. But in the last um, draft, the final draft, the signed version, the two paragraphs about the operation of the computer system reappear. Can you see that? There's one on the page there. And then if we scroll to the next page, I think they just... Yes, 
Um, no reason to believe the information in this statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the computer. I think they've been combined into they um, a compressed version of both statements. Yes. So standing back at the moment from this um, run of correspondence, would you agree that Mr Jenkins um, openly referred to system failure in his original draft of the statement? Yes. It was Mr Ward who objected on behalf of the post office to the um, reference to system failures? Yes. Mr Ward inserted his criticisms of the inclusion of those words into a text of the statement. This yes. is a really poor choice of words. Yes. And that it appears to be Mr Ward who was pressing for the amendment of the statement because Mr Ward was worried about how system failure might be interpreted and that it might actually help a defendant. Yes. Putting aside whether um, that approach was acceptable, I think you said that um, each of the versions of the statement um, ought to have been disclosed, in particular because from 2005 onwards, the CPIA code at paragraph 5.1 required drafts of statements to have been recorded on the unused schedule if they differed materially from the final version. Yes. And because applying the disclosure test um, for reasons that Mr Ward had identified, this was material that undermined the prosecution case and failed to be disclosed anyway. So the, um, the failure to um, reveal uh, by recording on the schedule um, the existence of these drafts may be a breach of Section 7 of the CPIA in that the reference to system failure in the drafts meant that um, they might reasonably be considered to be uh, capable of undermining the prosecution or assisting the defence. Yes. So gathering all of that information together, had the post office adhered to the law in relation to disclosure here, then the fact that the witness statement had evolved over time and at whose insistence it had evolved over time would have been revealed to the defence. Yes. Um, that can come down, thank you. You, you tell us um, in paragraph 213 of your report, which is on page 82, that the snapshot of data that Mr Jenkins examined in his witness statement was a very restricted one. Yes and that the um, examination which was undertaken does not appear to have been disclosed, so its limitations were unlikely to have been appreciated by the defence. Um, having seen now the underlying uh, material and putting aside um, the fact that the work done reflected, I think, what Mr Jenkins had been asked to do, um, uh, do you agree that um, Mr Jenkins um, sought guidance as to um, uh, whether what he was doing was the correct approach. I'm not sure I entirely follow that. Let's look at um, uh, some other um, uh, material then. Um, FUJ 0012 And if we scroll down, please. Um, if you just scroll up a little bit. <coughs> and again. So I think this is an email of the 30th of March um, between Mr. Jenkins and Mr. Pinder. Uh, saying I've taken the data from the peak, 
do you recall what peaks were? No. You don't? Okay. Um, and carried out my own analysis of it and presented the results in the attached Word document. Hopefully, this is the sort of thing that the post office wants. If you want to pass it through to them before Thursday, then fine. So the peak was um, an incident management system uh, maintained and operated by um, Fujitsu that recorded um, the uh, reporting, uh, investigation, and possible escalation of system issues within a certain level of service help desk within um, Fujitsu. Yes. And he says, Mr. Jenkins says, he's taken the data off the peak, so from that system. Yes. And if we can look, please, at um, FUJ at 0012 2229. This is the attachment to that um, email that we've just looked at. Um, this note, um, so it's under Mr. Um, Jenkins' um, hand. Uh, this note is provided as, as input to a witness statement regarding Garwin. Penny Thomas provided me with extracts from three, um, for three periods from audited data. I've taken this data and extracted detail of all banking transactions and analyze the zero value transactions. The following table provides a summary. And then the three ARQ periods um, are set out by reference to the three ARQ numbers, 401, 459, and 460. And then scroll down. <laughs> I've produced a separate spreadsheet. And then he goes on and explains what he's done. Yes. So my question, and I cut to the chase too quickly with you, Mr. Atkinson was that what Mr. Jenkins did was tell Mr. Pinder, this is what I've done, attaching this Word document, and um, essentially asking, is this correct? Is this what the post office want? By saying in his covering email, hopefully, what, uh, this is what the post office want. Yes. Can you recall any reply to that? coming back to him and saying, no, you've done the wrong thing? Um, I can't recall one, no. Uh, and this uh, material does reflect what is in the <laughs> statement of the 6th of, 6th of April. April. Yes, uh, exactly. Did you see any um, instruction or guidance to Mr Jenkins? about the retention of working materials such as this or the disclosure of underlying analysis, the type of which is referred to in this document? No. Um, is that the type of material that should be um, retained by an expert witness and um, made available for disclosure? Yes. Um, thank you very much. If we go back to paragraph 213 of your report, which is on page 82. Yes. Just wait for that to come up. In paragraph 213, in the middle of the paragraph, can you see a line which says, Mr. Jenkins of Fujitsu um, does not have been, appear to have been asked to review the underlying data more generally. And then this, but does appear to have provided reassurances to the integrity of the system. 
despite that underlying data not being analysed. Yes. Are you there referring to that line at the end or that paragraph at the end of Mr Jenkins' witness statement? Yes. Can we look at that, please? FUJ 0012 2237. And if we just look at the um, uh, end of the witness statement, please. And up a, a little, please. Uh, it's that paragraph, there's no reason to believe the information in the statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the computer. To the best of my knowledge and belief at all material times, the computer was operating properly or if not, any respect in which it was not operating properly or was out of operation um, was not such as to affect the information held on it. Yes. And this is the abridged version of those two computer operation paragraphs Absolutely. That, that we saw um, uh, earlier. Yes. And is it the line, um, to the best of my knowledge and belief, at all material times the computer was operating properly? Yes. That you're referring to? Yes. If we go back to the beginning of the statement, please. And if we scroll down, in the second paragraph, you'll see uh, Mr. Jenkins refers to the peak system. Fujitsu have a fault management system called the peak system, which is used for passing faults around the team and tracking faults raised, by, uh, raised regarding the post office um, account. And then subsequently, Mr. Jenkins records um, that um, he uh, extracted data from the peak system. I extracted data from this system regarding the Garwin post office. And then he says, from this data, I then extracted all the banking transactions which showed a zero value. That's ARQ data. Yes. He then produces spreadsheets analyzing um, uh, the existence of or the reasons for um, at the zero values. The statement at the end, if we go to it at the foot of the next page, please. If we keep going, sorry, page three, bottom. There's uh, no reason to believe that the information in this statement is inaccurate because of improper use of the computer. Was your understanding that the computer that was being referred to was the peak system or the horizon system on which the ARQ data was stored and from which it was obtained, or could you not tell? Um, my reading was the latter, that it related to the, relating to the Horizon system, um, uh, but it's not altogether clear. So I think you read the, this paragraph, the abridged version of what is a standard paragraph in other witness statements, as equating to an opinion that Horizon was working properly insofar as it affected the Garwin branch at all relevant times. Yes. Rather than that the information in the witness statement refers to information extracted from the peak system. Rather than that that paragraph related just to the peak system. Yes. Thank you. Can you see that this um, statement is at least open to interpretation? Yes. Um, that can come down, thank you. Um, before repeal, would you agree that Section 69 of PACE permitted the admission into evidence of a statement contained within a document where that document had been produced by a computer? Yes. Um, there was, I think you will remember, concern that the ambit and effect of Section 69 of 
um, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act had been um, fundamentally um, understood, misunderstood. Do you remember a case of minors? Yes. Which you cite in your yes. um, uh, second report. Was Section 69 in fact only concerned with um, admission of um, facts into evidence rather than whether the facts were true? Yes, it was to do with the operation of the system rather than the truth of the content. And I don't suppose you can, um, you can assist us on um, whether uh, you've explained how you understood that statement um, as referring to Horizon more generally. Yes. Um, you can't under assist, uh, assist us as to what Mr Jenkins' obviously intention was on the basis of the materials that you've seen. No, um, although that um, perhaps underlines why the iterations and evolution of this statement was um, so important um, and why its disclosure was so important because um, it was that underlying material that would help someone, um, particularly someone acting on behalf of the defendant, to um, approach what he meant by this and what his intention was. And so in circumstances where an investigator, as we've seen, um, the material suggests, took a witness statement from Mr Jenkins, would you agree that um, if the witness um, was asked to include a form of word such as this at the end of their witness statement, it was important that it was made clear to the witness what the words were supposed to indicate? Yes, particularly where they had expressed reasons as to why um, its relation to the operation of the Horizon system um, would not be something that they would sign up to. Because the witness was saying, I've looked at one computer system, the peak system, I've identified from that some data that I need to look at, three lots of ARQ data. Okay. I've extracted the three lots of ARQ data from Horizon. The computer system was working. Yes. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing say, it. And what I'm not saying um, is that the Horizon system um, was operating correctly. That, that's um, so that it was clear what this um, assertion as to correct operation related to and what it equally importantly didn't relate to. Yes. And so you would agree, I think, that um, it was important that it should be made clear to the witness what the words um, were supposed to mean and to which system they were intended to relate. Yes. Can we move forwards, please, to FUJ 0015-2616? Uh, can we look at page three to start with, please? Uh, we've moved on from March and April into um, the summer. If we scroll down, please. And again, please. Sorry, just scroll up a little bit more. And a little bit more. Yeah, this is an email um, to uh, Diane Matthews, the investigator of um, the, this case from Mr. Jenkins. Um, at the top of the, or the bottom of the next page, you will see it's dated the 12th of July. And Mr. Jenkins um, says, I understand also, second paragraph, that this trial is at Carnarvon. Do you have any idea as to how much time will be involved and exactly what is required? I've never been to court before. I'm sorry, I've never been to court in any capacity. And my knowledge of such things is based on films and television, which I'm sure are inaccurate. And then if we go to page one, uh, page two, please. Let me scroll up. <coughs> and again. Um, we can see um, the reply from uh, Miss Matthews. Uh, just scroll down to her second paragraph. 
a third paragraph rather, which is a reply to the request for help from Mr. Jenkins. All witnesses will have to be present on the first day unless the defence has agreed their statement and uh, do not wish to ask any questions about that evidence. And then this, um, it's pretty much as you see on the TV really. Uh, but remember that you will have sight of your statement prior to taking the stand and can only be asked questions specifically about your statement. But was that guidance appropriate? I'm not altogether sure what it means, but insofar as I understand it, no. What do you understand it to mean? Well, um, I understand it to be saying that um, the criminal process is like a TV programme, uh, presuming an American TV programme by reference to the stand, um, uh, and that the witness can only be asked questions about what is already in their witness statement, and I don't know where that comes from, even in America. Would you agree that that part is positively misleading? Yes. Because it's wrong? Yes. And it, would it carry any special relevance in circumstances where um, a witness had already asked for aspects of their, uh, had already been asked to delete aspects of their witness statement and was now being told by the prosecutor, you can't be asked questions about things outside your witness statement. You'll only be asked questions specifically about your statement. Yes, I suppose it, it might have a different message to someone if they understood that the various drafts of their statement had also been um, disclosed and therefore questions about their statement might include that, but subject to that, um, it, it would tell them that it, the final draft is all that you're going to be asked about. Thank you. But that can come down. Uh, having reviewed the um, emails, um, correspondence, and draft statements that we've seen, uh, would you agree with the suggestion that um, overall the post office appeared to seek to harden up Mr. Jenkins' witness statement? Yes. And looking at that um, series of communications and drafts, do you agree that it succeeded in that objective? Yes. But do you agree that Mr. Jenkins participated in that enterprise? Yes. And I think you've agreed that all of the drafts that we've seen, uh, including observations within the drafts and the communications themselves, ought to have been disclosed? Yes. Thank you. Can we turn to the case of Suzanne Palmer, please? Uh, you address this in paragraph 229 of your um, report. Well, in fact, you start at 220, but the bit I want to ask about is 229, which yes, is on page you. 87. In um, paragraph 229 on page 87, just wait for it to come up. Uh, you comment that um, prosecuting counsel Stephen John provided an advice on evidence which identified a number of lines of inquiry or investigation that he thought should be pursued, but that other than commenting on the particulars of the indictment, he didn't advise on the sufficiency of evidence and say this was another opportunity uh, to review uh, where there was a pro whether there was a proper evidential basis to assert dishonesty was lost. Yes. Would you agree that dishonesty as an element of um, uh, many offences is one which more often than not is proved by inference from the circumstances rather than by direct evidence? Yes. Would you agree that if Mr. John, as prosecuting counsel, had uh, taken the view that there was not sufficient evidence to satisfy the first limb of the full code test, he um, could not have properly continued to prosecute the case? I'm not sure I altogether follow that. Clearly, if he 
identified that the, there was insufficient evidence to prove dishonesty for the purposes of theft, um, he should have said so. Um, whether he would have um, been professionally embarrassed so that he would have to have withdrawn from the case if that advice was not acted on is, is, is a separate question, I think not a very clear-cut one. But put it another way then, it, given he advised on further lines of inquiry, is it implicit or can we draw an inference reasonably that he had read all of the papers, he'd considered the evidence in the case and decided that there was a reasonable prospect of conviction, even if he never said so? Uh, that would be one interpretation um, and that might be the right interpretation. It would um, perhaps to an extent depend on what his instructions asked him to do. Um, certainly that the standard instructions such as I have seen them in across these 22 cases um, do ask um, counsel instructed to draft the indictment and to advise on evidence. Um, and where I've seen them, uh, I've seen advices from counsel that firstly say I attach the indictment and why it does or doesn't include um, what it does or doesn't include, um, and um, a list of further things that are required. Um, the instructions to counsel didn't specifically ask them to advise as to the sufficiency of evidence and whether they agreed that this was a proper case to prosecute or not. So I, I could see that there would be, there may be circumstances where a prosecutor would not understand that's what they're being asked, although I have to say I think they would still be duty bound to do so. Um, but it may also be that those who instruct them were not expecting them to do that uh, and therefore their failure to do it wouldn't necessarily tell them very much one way or the other. In fact, we've heard from the lawyers so far that the request to advise on evidence was meant to um, encompass, was intended to encompass a request to advise on evidential sufficiency, not just further lines of inquiry. And the counsel that we've heard from, the only one, Mr. Tapford, has said that he understood the request to advise on evidence to include a requirement to advise on evidential sufficiency. But the um, vagaries of life at the criminal bar were such that there was often not time to do so. Certainly, um, my experience would be that, that um, if you were instructed to prosecute a case, you would not just be looking at whether there was a statement from the plan drawer, you would be looking to see um, whether the case was sustainable or not. Thank you. Can we turn to the case of Susan Rudkin, please? I've skipped over um, Josephine Hamilton. And um, if we can look, please, at paragraph 306 of your report, um, which is on page 113. Uh, in this paragraph, and it's an observation that you make elsewhere in your report too, you say that um, although the post office may have had evidence of theft or fraud by way of admissions, um, it did not have sufficient evidence or at least there had been insufficient consideration of the adequacy of the evidence to prove the level of the loss. Uh, this is a point that you make a number of times in the report. Yes. Would you agree that the amount of particularised loss in a charge can be relevant to an assessment of whether a prosecution is in the public interest? Yes. Uh, any sentencing exercise? Absolutely. And confiscation or other ancillary orders? Yes, both as to whether it's appropriate to do it and certainly as to how much you're asking for. Would you agree that although there's a requirement to prove that there was a loss for offences of theft, the courts do not generally consider the amount of loss to be a material averment in a count on an indictment? No, that's right. Because the amount of loss is not a relevant consideration in assessing whether a defendant is guilty or not? It's not a necessary um, requirement to establish that, that's right. And so what's the force of your criticism here then in the light of um, those points? Um, that in this case and in such 
cases where there were questions as to whether there was theft, um, it was clearly relevant for the investigation to do what it could to identify what it was being said had been taken. Um, and it was necessary for a prosecutor in deciding whether to prosecute to have a sense um, and an understanding of what had been taken um, because uh, it was relevant to the assessment of whether there was a realistic prospect of conviction, but it was also relevant to the assessment of the public interest uh, and where there was a lack of evidence as to that. It, 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 difficult to see how, without further inquiry, one could go from the beginning to the end of the charging process without, at any stage, um, raising that as a concern. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Uh, or Ms. Rodkin's case um, raises issues of post-conviction disclosure as well, which you address um, in your report. Um, on the previous page, at page 305, at the foot of the page. You say in the subsequent 2014 review by Cartwright King, the post office retained the view there was no evidence of horizon failings um, contributing to the loss and was clearly aware of uh, potential issues with cross-disclosure to other cases. That advice took a concerning approach to post-conviction disclosure focusing on the consequences of disclosure rather than whether it was required. Can we just look at that, yes. um, please, this concerning approach to post-conviction disclosure? It's poll 3046579. We can see um, that this is the um, case of Mr. Um, Rudkin, Mrs. Rudkin's husband. And if we scroll down, please. Um, analysis. Uh, this is written by Harry Bowyer, uh, yeah. um, in-house barrister at Cartwright King. Uh, it's the post office's firm belief that the major losses suffered by the applicant were caused by theft by his wife. Other minor losses, very minor losses, were likely to have been caused by simple human error. There's no evidence to support the applicant's assertions. There were failings with Horizon, which contributed to losses at the branch. Unless this position is resolved from this case, should not cause any problems uh, with any post office prosecutions past or pending. And then over the page, please. Um, dangers to post office. Um, second paragraph. If concessions are made that might render this conviction unsafe, then the applicant's wife may well be put in a position whereby she is able to appeal that conviction. Were an appeal to succeed, then the post office would be open to a claim for damages and or restitution of monies paid by this appellant under any confiscation order. Such concessions would have to be disclosed to those with similar convictions. This may well necessitate a review of many hundreds of cases to establish who else may be entitled to such disclosure if concessions are made that might render the sentence imposed manifestly excessive, then the applicant might well be in a, put in a position whereby she might be able to appeal that sentence with similar consequences for post office. Again, those concessions would have to be disclosed. And then finally, this is not a case where any concessions can or should be made. To do so has the potential to render her conviction by guilty plea unsafe or her sentence as manifestly excessive and accordingly invite an application to the Court of Appeal. Are they the paragraphs uh, which you thought indicated a concerning approach to post-conviction disclosure? Yes. And can you just explain why, please? Well, if the position was that there was no material that, um, and that material had been reviewed, um, that there was no material following a review that um, identified any um, horizon issues in relation to Mrs. Rudkin's case, then there would be no material that needed to be 
disclose and no concession that there were horizon issues needed to be made, and that would be on a proper assessment of the material. If the reason not to make such a concession was that it might allow um, a, a proper appeal against conviction, or it might show that the figure of loss was not as had been contended, such that the sentence that was imposed was um, excessive, um, then, then that would not be a proper reason to disclose. Indeed, if the, a concession um, properly would allow for a, um, an appeal to be advanced, then that would be a reason to disclose it rather than not. Um, if if the, the reason for not making a concession in, in one case was its impact on others, where that was a concession that was rightly to be made, then that's not a reason not to make it. Um, and so my concern was looking at this document overall, it, it was not clear to me as the final assessment whether it was being assessed here that there was nothing that needed to be conceded or that there were reasons of impact why they didn't want to concede it. Yeah, can we look, please, at uh, uh, another um, example? Uh, this involves Lynette Hutchins, whilst we're looking at post-conviction disclosure. Poll 006-0715. This is addressed 435 to 436 in your report, Mr. Thank Hutchins. you. So poll 006-0715. Um, this is um, an advice written by Simon Clark of Cartwright King. And if we just scroll through it, please. Uh, the offence is set out. The case history is described. If we uh, carry on through the case history. And over the page. It sets out the prosecution case. If we continue. And continue, please. And keep going. And then um, discussion. Defendants unequivocally admitted making false entries into Horizon. Um, in the belief that the balances would be corrected in the fullness of time, she stated in her prepared statement she didn't do so dishonestly. Had she chosen to advance that account at trial, the jury would have been entitled to accept what she said and to acquit her or to reject her account or convict her. Thus, the opportunity was there for her to seek an acquittal over the page. Um, uh, there's a discussion um, in, about Eden in paragraphs 11 and 12. Um, 13 addresses... Um, the defence statement, and then 14 addresses conviction. Um, Mr Clark says it's not the purpose of this review, nor of the review process overall, to determine whether or not any particular conviction is unsafe. That decision is reserved to the Court of Appeal only. The purpose of this process is to identify those cases where the material contained in the second site interim report would have met the test for disclosure as provided by the CPIA the code of practice enacted thereunder, and the AG's guidelines on disclosure, had that material been known to Post Office Limited during the currency of the prosecution, and accordingly would um, or ought to have been disclosed to the um, defence. And then over the page. In this case, I advise, given the chronology and circumstances of the guilty plea, the reference in the basis of plea to the leading case on the topic, uh, and the second site report and the Helen Rose report would not have been disclosable during the currency of the prosecution and accordingly do not now fall to be disclosed. Had we possessed the material at the relevant time, we would not have disclosed it to the defence. Uh, why do you say that um, this misunderstands the disclosure test? It proceeds on the basis that um, there was a guilty plea um, she, um, she, Ms. Hutchins, could have contested this matter at trial. She chose not to. She had legal advice. So um, that's down to her. Um, it, it doesn't recognise that there was a stage before Mrs. Hutchins was arraigned. And it was at that stage that the question should have been asked as to whether there was material that was capable of undermining the prosecution case or assisting hers um, that ought to have been disclosed. And 
this is all concerning, um, as I read it, um, that the second site review and the issues that it gave rise to as to whether the operation of Horizon and material relating to the operation of Horizon had been properly appreciated and or disclosed. A and to say we don't need to worry about this because she pleaded is to ignore the fact that there should have been disclosure before she had the opportunity to. To say um, there's a reference in her basis of plea to Eden, therefore she was clearly advised by counsel, ignores the fact that counsel had not had this material disclosed to them either, uh, uh, and um, a failure to recognise that it was at least possible that counsel told that the basis for the prosecution case was susceptible to challenge, may have given different advice to his client to one who was not told that. Uh, uh, and, uh, and also that, that in relation to any appeal um, against um, sentence um, that was potentially available and or to submissions that could be made to a judge before sentence, issues as to the operation of the system and confirmation of those issues by the prosecution would have been of assistance to the defendant. Um, it, it, it is a different thing for a judge to consider a case where the explanation is given that this was inadvertent uh, um, rather than anything deliberately by the defendant on the one hand and to be, have that confirmed by the prosecution on the other. Um, at that time and um, indeed today, the um, uh, leading um, decision, uh, in fact the operative decision on post-conviction disclosure obligations um, was that of the Supreme Court in Nunn. Yes. Um, and the decision was reflected in the then Attorney General's guidelines on disclosure at paragraphs 59 and 60, um, the acid test being whether there presently existed information which might cast doubt upon the safety of the conviction. Yes. And that test is to be applied, if I got this right, um, irrespective of whether uh, there was a plea or not. It's material that might cast doubt on the safety of the conviction, yes. however the conviction was obtained. Yes. And overall, then, in these two cases, when you describe the approach to post-conviction disclosure as being in the one case concerning and in the other case involving a fundamental um, uh, misunderstanding of... Um, at the test to apply, uh, are you saying that the approach that was being taken was inconsistent with the law? Yes. Thank you. So we're about to move to another case study, that of Peter Holmes. It's one o'clock. Might we break until two, please? So of course. <coughs>
Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr Atkinson. Can we um, turn to Peter Holmes, please? Yes. In paragraphs 309 to 333 of your report, no need to display them, but they're on page 114 and following, you deal with the prosecution of Peter Holmes. <clears throat> One of the things um, that happened was that in interview, Mr Holmes said, it's the horizon system that has let us down. Um, that was an interview taking place in September 2008. That was after um, a civil claim involving the Cleveland's branch and Mrs. Um, Julie Wollstenholm had been settled after she raised horizon integrity issues after the formation in December 2005 of a group to examine horizon integrity issues um, after the trial of Lee Castleton in um, involving Lee Castleton in uh, 2007 in which he had directly challenged uh, the horizon system and after a jury had acquitted Suzanne Palmer in less than 10 minutes uh, in 2007 uh, her having raised issues with the integrity of the horizon system um, was there um, to your understanding any investigation of um, Horizon um, integrity or the figures produced by Horizon? No. The um, investigation report recorded that uh, Mr Holmes had spent many years in the police service um, and that he had been a sub-postmaster at the Monk Seaton branch office um, for six or seven years. Um, he was of good character. Uh, should such good character be um, have been brought into account when considering the investigation of an offence or the merits of prosecution? It should certainly have been a factor in the public interest test. It would not have been the only factor or necessarily the decisive factor, but it was a factor. Um, I'm afraid I, I can't speak as to whether it was taken into account in the charging decision because the public interest didn't get a mention. Um, uh, it was a factor relevant to the assessment of Mr Holmes's credibility. Um, he, he, as with any person of good character, their good character is a factor in their favour in the assessment of their credibility. Again, not decisively so, um, but a relevant factor in that regard as well. In fact, it was used against him in the investigation report. Yes. Because he said that he hadn't reported the accruing um, uh, shortfalls showing on Horizon for some 11 months. And the investigator said that it was incredulous um, that he should do so, um, have not have done so, having spent many years in the police service and having been the sub postmaster for six or seven months, uh, six or seven years at um, Monk, Seed Monk Seaton. So it was used um, against him. Ought um, his um, previous position and uh, the longevity of his service to be a factor in deciding whether to take seriously concerns raised uh, by him in interview about the reliability of the Horizon system? Uh, certainly not as a reason not yeah. to take those matters seriously. And in, in reality, does it matter who you are? if you raise issues such as this in an interview, whether you've got good character or not, as to the pursuit of a reasonable line of inquiry? No, but, but as I said, it, the fact that you um, are of, of, of good character may support your credibility in raising an issue and perhaps give an extra underlining to why it needs to be investigated. Thank you very much. I'm going to move over the cases of um, Seema Misra, Lynette Hutchins, Joan Bailey and Alison Hall and turn to um, Alison Henderson. Uh, that's paragraph um, 515 of your report to 519. So I'm so sorry. Yes, in paragraph um, 515 of your report, when you're dealing with Mrs. Henderson's case, it, you say that her case was um, one where acceptance of her plea was dependent upon repayment and a lack of criticism of Horizon. Yes. Um, and that's a theme that you returned to in uh, 649, which we looked at earlier. Yes. Um, uh, when you're making your general points. 
Um, would you accept that there is a difference between acceptance of a plea on the one hand and acceptance of a basis of plea on the other? Yes. You cite in 506, um, that's page, <coughs> excuse me, 179. If we just go to that 179. that you say on the uh, 16th of November, um, on the date on which it appears that a second defence statement was served, uh, prosecution counsel Diane Cham reported, quote, have spoken to defence solicitor who indicated the defendant may be willing to plead to false accounting and pay money back, taking instructions from Chris. Um, uh, that's a reference to Christopher Knight, uh, the investigator, we think who has confirmed that he would be happy to proceed on that basis. Um, and you say that Mr Bowyer's 2014 review recorded the defence had told the investigator by phone that the defendant might plead guilty to uh, false accounting. And then Mr Wilson's uh, response to Diane Chan's email said, clearly if there were to be a plea to the false accounting, but on the basis that Horizon... Uh, the Horizon system was at fault. That would not be an acceptable basis of plea for the um, prosecution. Um, do you agree that what was being said by Mr Wilson was not about acceptability of plea, but rather acceptability of a potential basis of plea? That's certainly an interpretation of, of, of that. It's not, I'd say, the interpretation the Court of Appeal reached, but it is an interpretation of it. Was um, the potential for a guilty plea to false accounting accompanied by repayment of shortfall um, an issue first raised by the defence? That's not altogether clear <coughs> because um, it's not clear who in the conversation between um, Diane Chan, um, who was prosecuting counsel, and defence counsel, who it was who first raised repayment. Uh, Certainly, it was part of what was communicated by her to those who instructed her. And so it's not clear who was tethering repayment um, to the plea? No. What's the basis for your... Uh, view that the post office made acceptance of the plea to false accounting conditional upon repayment? Um, in part, um, I, I confess I was influenced by that being the finding of the Court of Appeal um, in that case, um, and I quote that at paragraph 511. Yes. Um, and the fact that the um, I was influenced, I suspect, also by the fact that by the time I dealt with the case of Mrs Henderson, I had already dealt with um, other cases where there had been that connection, uh, those, for example, of, of Mrs Hall. Thank you. Uh, can we move to the case of Grant Allen, please? Uh, which you uh, address from uh, your paragraph 516 onwards on page um, 182. And uh, can we look at some of the underlying material here, please? Um, can we start, please, with um, poll 309-7138? Again, this principally involves a series of questions about liaison between Post Office Fujitsu and Mr Jenkins. Yes. Um, in the preparation of um, evidence, whether witness statements or reports, um, for the prosecution of um, Mr. Allen. Um, if we um, scroll down, please. Uh, keep going. And one more. Thank you. An email from Rachel Panter. If we just scroll up, we'll see that it's on the 16th of November. Thank you. Um, uh, Rachel Panter, um, she um, is a lawyer at uh, Cartwright King, um, to Gareth Jenkins. 
as you may already be aware, your um, expert report detailing the reliability of the Horizon system has been served as evidence in a number of cases. We've seen a similar email to this, um, I think, twice yesterday. Yes. Um, to date, uh, most, if not all, cases raising Horizon system as an issue have been unable or unwilling to particularise what specific issues they may have with the system and how that shapes the nature of their defence. I'd like to serve your report um, in each case listed uh, below, and we can see that one of them is um, Mr... Allen's number six at the Chester um, Crown Court. Yes. And if we scroll down, please. Uh, just under the um, Grant Allen uh, highlighted yellow part, it says, I'd like to serve your report in the remaining cases and have attached a case, case summary of each listed above so you may familiarise yourself with the facts of each case. Um, and then if we go over the page, sorry, it was at the foot of the previous page actually. In order for me to serve your report in time, please could you in, uh, either send copies of your reports via special delivery or as an email attachment. Um, and the paragraph above the request was to read the case summaries, send five original signed and dated copies of your report to her. Yes. Uh, can we see what happened next, please? Um, FUJ 0015-3856. And then scroll down, please. And again. And again. And again. And again, Mr. Jenkins um, replies by saying, can't you use the report I've already sent you? There's no mention of the case on the report, i.e. no mention of any of the cases that you have listed. You should really be addressing such requests through Post Office Limited rather than directly to myself. There's no commercial cover. And then um, up the page, please. Um, concerned about the approach taken. We saw that yesterday and then up the page again. Uh, and to keep going to Miss Panther's email. Um, she says, um, as I provided a list of cases, rather than approach um, each individual investigator to each case and then repose the same question, I thought it would save time and duplication. Um, in response to your email, Gareth, I do intend to use the report that you've already provided. It doesn't matter. You've not mentioned a specific case in your report, um, as there has not been any specific criticisms raised by the defendants provided in my list of cases. And then reading on, what I propose to do is serve your statement on each defence solicitor so that the issue of Horizon is addressed. That will then place the onus on the defence to specify what, if anything, they say is wrong with the Horizon system. That's why it's important for you to consider the case summaries that I've provided so you're familiar with each case. Uh, looking at that exchange um, as it stands at that point in time, um, were there um, problems with the approach that was being taken? Yes, we, we considered <clears throat> yesterday the, the issues um, potentially with the generic statement and what it did or did not do. Uh, and here we have further um, communication in relation to that generic statement and, and the decision that was taken to rely on um, effectively bald assertion that there was um, nothing to see here in relation to the operation of the horizon system rather than to look at the data on a case-by-case -case basis on a branch-by-branch -branch basis to identify whether there was something to see or not. And if so, what? 
so the post office wasn't con itself considering each case on its merits and not instructing Mr Jenkins as an expert in each case. No, that's right. It was effectively a, a one-size-fit-all answer um, to any suggestion from any postmaster that there may be an issue with Horizon without actually looking to see whether there was in their case. It, uh, it, the post office, was not providing Mr Jenkins with any instructions specific to the case in question? Or data, no. And it was proposing um, to give, or it did give, Mr Jenkins nothing more than um, a bare case summary in each case? Quite. Uh, that's aside from the limitations of the statement itself, the generic statement itself? Yes. What did you understand the provision of a case summary to be for? What was its purpose? Again, it wasn't altogether clear to me what its intended purpose was, other than so that um, Mr Jenkins would know perhaps which post office it was, um, the name of the defendant, um, the amount of the shortfall. It perhaps would have given him some indication as to what the postmaster had said in interview about it, but it didn't, wasn't asking him to do anything with that information because other than see, to know it. I'm sorry, as we see here, um, the post office was uh, via its agent telling Mr Jenkins it didn't matter that he had not referred to a specific case in his report, and yet it was telling him to read the case summary yes. for each case. Yes. And was that approach made better or worse by the fact that the statement on its face did not explain that it was itself responsive to the four questions that we saw earlier? It, it, it made it worse in the sense that, that um, no one coming to a particular case um, from, the, from a defence perspective, for example, or a court's perspective, would know, would properly understand what this statement was or where it had come from. And the, the genesis of it. Absolutely. And if it's right that it contained limitations, what those limitations were? No. Can we go forwards to FUJ 0015 3865? Uh, we're, we're, we've moved forward now to the end of November and an email from uh, a different solicitor at Cartwright King in the case of Allen and also in the case of um, Sefton and Neild, uh, Andrew Bolt, copied to Miss Panter, to Mr Jenkins, please find and close outlines of the two cases which involve me. Of the two, Sefton and Neil is the more urgent. Concentrate on that one first. The Allen um, case is only for plea and case management on the 10th of December. In an ideal world, I'd like to serve a report before the 10th, if possible. Uh, that um, doesn't improve the extent of the instructions that Mr uh, Jenkins is being given, does it? No. And if we look, please, at FUJ... 00124105. Uh, Mr. Jenkins replies on the 3rd of December, adding, I think, Penny Thomas to the chain, saying to Mr. Bolt, um, thanks for the info you've supplied me we, with me on these two cases. I thought I should try and clarify exactly what you want from me. My understanding from Rachel was all that is required is a signed version of a standard report I produced a couple of months ago. If that's the case, I can get that produced, scanned and emailed to you in a couple of days. However, having read through the info you've given me, perhaps you want me to cover some further things, some observations. And then Mr Jenkins sets out some um, further lines of um, inquiry. Yes. Um, number one in the um, Sefton and Neil case, and number two, contrasting the Allen case to the Sefton and Neil case. 
would you agree that at this point, um, Mr. Jenkins uh, appears to be seeking clarification as to exactly what it was that the lawyers wanted him to do, uh, given that they wanted a standard statement, uh, because these cases, they said, didn't give rise to specific horizon systems? It, it, it's a combination of, of seeking clarification, because he does say that he's trying to clarify, but also an offer of further help that he could give on particular issues that he's spotted from the case summaries, I presume, that he had seen. Yes. Can we move forward to FUJ 0015-3881? And if we scroll down, please. And again. And again. And again. And once more. Um, just stop there. Um, if we just scroll up to catch the date, it should be the 4th of November, uh, 4th of December, from Mr. Bolt to Mr. Jenkins. In the case of um, Alan, I've just spoken to the solicitor for Grant Allen, then skipping a paragraph. I attach an extract from Mr. Allen's interview. As in the case summary I sent you, he's trying to suggest that an initial loss of £3,000 is attributable to lost data, which has not reached head office because of installation problems. Are you able to comment on this scenario at all? Ultimately, we would need to discredit this as an explanation that holds any water. He denies stealing uh, the subsequent losses and therefore, by implication, may be seeking to blame the system for these losses as well. Is the um, email from Mr. Bolst, the lawyer, consistent or inconsistent with the proper instruction of an expert in that it appears informally to ask Mr. Jenkins if he can comment at all on a defence explanation? Uh, it's inconsistent, but not just for that reason. That there, there's um, potentially no issue depending on how it is done with, with putting a scenario to an expert and asking for their assessment of it. Um, but, but here the, the, the tenor of the, of the message is, is rather different and that the use of the word we, ultimately we would need to discredit this as an explanation that holds any water uh, and the approach being to discredit this as an explanation that holds any water. Neither of those things um, really um, fit, well, not really fit, neither of those things fit um, with the instruction of an independent expert by um, someone acting as a Minister of Justice. So rather than doing what it should do, which was, um, if it hadn't been done before, to state the expert's duties of independence, it actively sought to suggest the outcome? Yes, and that they were working as a team to get there. Um, can we look, please, at FUJ 0015 this That's, in fact, this document in the reply further up um, the page, please. If we carry on to see Mr Jenkins' reply, and if we keep going. Um, also, um, since the next day, 5th of December, I've had a look at the statement here, and I think it might be helpful to have a dig as to exactly what went on in the branch at the time of the loss. I think I understand what he's claiming. However, where there are comms problems, it's normal to recover any missing data once the comms are sorted out, provided it's, it's within 35 days. So this shouldn't be a reason for a loss. Also, there are processes in place to retrieve outstanding data where there are extended comms issues lasting more than seven days so as to meet contractual uh, obligations. I could just make a general statement relating to that or if we retrieve data from the time, I could check out exactly what is happening. Uh, skip the next paragraph. Um, uh, we should note, um, we have not requested any, uh, post office has not requested any audit data, yeah. nor been asked about help desk calls. 
uh, is it worth asking post office to request such data for me to examine before putting together a specific statement or is a simple generic one um, sufficient and then some cost issues so mr jenkins highlighting no request for audit data or help desk call records and that there are two ways of going about this and asking for instruction as to which the prosecutor required yes if we go further up the page please Uh, second line, Mr. Bolse's reply, I would appreciate if you could add your general comments at this stage regarding the safeguards in place for comms problem to your statement. Send this to me as before. I'll refer back to the post office to consider whether we go on to request the retrieval of data for your further analysis. Uh, so this exchange, I think you'll agree, shows that Mr. Jenkins informed the post office lawyers that he could examine the data um, to work out, quote, exactly what had happened at the branch. Yes. Um, the post office um, said that they didn't want um, this to occur in response in yes. the first instance. And if we look, please, at poll 3089380, we should be able to see um, an email between Mr. Bolton, and the investigator. Please see um, Mr. Jenkins' report. I'd asked him to look at non-polling issue raised in the interview, and I believe that he had dealt with it adequately. Gareth tells me that it's in fact possible for him to retrieve the actual data from this time to see what actually occurred at this branch and that the retrieval of the data is free to poll. It would take approximately two and a half days for him to look at it and analyze what it means, and this will be chargeable to poll at two and a half thousand pounds. I've told him that at present we do not uh, wish to pursue this option unless it becomes unavoidable. And then some instructions. Uh, Mr. Jenkins then um, signed a witness statement in Mr. Allen's case on um, at the 17th of December. This was identical to the general statement, the generic statement that had been uh, signed back earlier in the year, except for the additional paragraph um, that had been included addressing the non-polling data. Uh, can we look, please, at that, at poll 3089007? Poll 3089007. Thank you. This is the statement um, dated uh, 17th of December. It's quite hard to read. Um, I'm not going to go through it because we're familiar with it as the generic statement. Just, but look, just look at the addition, which is on page two. And if we scroll down, um, so if we just scroll up a moment. He says, I've been asked to provide a statement in the case of Grant Allen. I understand the integrity um, of the system has been questioned. And this report provides some general information regarding the integrity of Horizon. And then if we scroll down. Uh, there is then in the paragraph underneath the explanation or Mr. Um, Jenkins' um, evidence on the non-polling issue and then over the page. Um, 
at the end of that paragraph that's at the top of the page, Mr Jenkins says, I've not had an opportunity to examine the detailed logs for this period to see whether there were any issues and any justification in the claim that this resulted in apparent system losses of £3,000 as claimed. Yes. So he's provided the generic explanation beforehand. Yes. Um, but made it clear, is this right, that um, he's not actually looked at the data? Yes. You tell us in your report that this was an unfortunate um, uh, failure in the evidence, uh, given that he, Mr Jenkins, was aware of the specific issue raised by Mr Allen and didn't follow through in the investigation of it. But this appears, however, to have been a post office decision. Yes. Looking at that um, underlying material, that can come down, thank you, that we've um, uh, examined, uh, rather than it appears to have been um, a post office decision not to obtain this data, the evidence uh, suggests that it was a post office decision uh, not to obtain the data. Yes, uh, the material that you've just gone through is more than I had seen when I wrote my report. And so... Um, would you agree that it's clear that in the face of Mr Jenkins saying that the obtaining of that data would resolve the question of what had happened in branch, the post office took the decision not to obtain the data? Yes. Was that consistent or inconsistent with its duty to pursue reasonable lines of inquiry? Inconsistent. And consistent or inconsistent with its duties of disclosure more generally? Inconsistent. In paragraph 545 of your um, report, um, which is on page 192, you say, um, so 192, uh, uh, 545, thank you. The greatest concern in this case is the instruction of and reliance on expert evidence from Mr Jenkins to rebut any question as to the integrity and reliability of Verizon. Uh, first, this is because his offer to examine data relating to Mr Allen's branch and his complaints was rejected in favour of a generic statement. We've seen that in the underlying material. Yes. This was clearly a missed opportunity for which little justification was advanced. Uh, do you stand by that comment in the light of the underlying material? Yes. Secondly, given that his generic statement was relied on, it is of a note that Mr Jenkins was in possession of material directly relevant to that question, which is nowhere referred to. His duty of disclosure ought to have at least required consideration of this, and I have um, seen no communication to suggest this. Again, do you stand by that comment in the light of the material we've looked at? Yes, and I also have in mind there um, the material I'd seen in the context of the case of Mrs Misra and, and the discussions um, back from in memory from 2010 about um, bugs in the system uh, and um, it is it is for others not me to, to um, opine as to whether those bugs had any potential relevance to the issues in Mr Allen's case that the generic statement didn't leave any room for there being any apparent bugs at all um, in, in the system, and that, I think, was the concern I was also addressing there. You continue a generic report was served, at which was flawed both in relation to the issue and also in relation to the limitations of the analysis of actual data that would have confirmed whether the Horizon system was operating correctly or not. Whilst there was discussion of this with Mr Jenkins, there does not appear to have been any disclosure of these important limitations. These represented very real disclosure failings in relation to expert evidence that the prosecution was relying on. Dealing with the two things that you um, addressed there, content of the report first, then disclosure um, second. You say the re uh, report, the statement was flawed in relation to the limitations of the analysis of the actual data that would have confirmed whether or not Horizon was operating correctly. Uh, given that Mr Jenkins had indicated to Mr Bolt that the data would show what had happened at the branch, given that uh, Mr Bolt, in conjunction with the investigator, Mr Bradshaw, had decided 
that Mr Jenkins shouldn't review the data. And given that Mr Jenkins stated in his witness statement in that paragraph I showed you that he hadn't examined the data, would you agree that it was the post office that was responsible for that flawed approach? Ultimately, yes. As to disclosure, which is the second and third sentences of that passage I've just um, read you there, um, uh, who was responsible for the um, very real disclosure failings that you identify? Well, th th the answer is, is both the post office as the prosecutor and Mr Jenkins as the expert, because both had disclosure responsibilities. Uh, and it was for the expert to comply with his responsibilities as an expert um, as to disclosure, and it was certainly for the post office as the prosecutor to comply with theirs. Thank you. Um, back in paragraph 528 of your report, which is on page 186. Uh, you refer to Mr. Jenkins' um, September 2010 uh, uh, witness statement, um, or report rather, concerning yes. the receipts and payments mismatch bug. Yes. And state that he did not disclose uh, those issues um, in Mr. Allen's case. No. And I think that's one of the things you were cross referring back to yes. there. Yes. The cross reference back to the Misra um, case. And then forward to um, paragraph 540, you say that that omission is of particular concern? Yes, in, in so far as I understood um, Mr Jenkins' report from September 2010 and, and put that against questions of the integrity and reliability of um, the system that his generic statement sought to address, it seemed to me um, that, that there was a disjunct um, between what was known by him and what was set out by him. And in, um, as we've seen in paragraph 545, you said that Mr Jenkins' own duty of disclosure ought to have at least required consideration of disclosure of that issue, and you have seen no communication to suggest that occurred. That's right, uh, because, again, and I may just have completely misunderstood the technical nature of all of this, but, but on the face of it, um, the September 2010 report represented uh, material that was um, inconsistent with, or potentially inconsistent with, conclusions that he was asserting in the generic statement, and as such, he had a duty to draw attention to that, irrespective of, of the prosecution's own uh, unquestionable obligation to do so. Do you agree, however, that in the material that you have seen, there's nothing to suggest that the post office informed Mr Jenkins of any disclosure duties that um, he owed personally, and in particular, at the time of the provision of the generic statement as an expert? No, that's right. I think it's right that your knowledge of the Misra case would indicate to you that the um, post office lawyer in that case, John L. Singh, um, was aware of uh, the calendar square bug, uh, the locking issue that had caused transactions to be lost. Um, Mr. Jenkins um, emailed to him saying that um, there had been um, 200,000 faults recorded on the system um, and um, uh, the provision of the receipts and payments uh, mismatch bug report to John L. Singh. Yes. Is there anything in the papers to suggest that in the Allen case, um, Mr. Singh considered that um, these needed to be explained or uh, disclosed uh, when the generic statement was being sought? Uh, I'm afraid not. And more generally, uh, is there anything to suggest that Mr Singh um, gave consideration to whether any of those issues 
needed to be referred to or explained um, when the generic statement was being sought, i.e. not just in the context of the Grant Allen case? Um, not that I've seen. Uh, ought um, the drafts of Mr Jenkins' um, original uh, witness statements, uh, in this case Grant Allen, to have been recorded um, on the schedule of unused material? As in drafts of the generic statements? Yes. As it evolved in this case, yes, they should. And in particular, would you agree that that may have revealed the extent to which uh, Mr Jenkins had been asked to address four questions and whether he had understood that he was being asked to answer only those questions and nothing else? Yes. <clears throat> Have you seen any evidence that in Mr Allen's case, the post office gave any formalised or um, reasoned consideration to obtaining um, recording and then disclosing information about um, Horizon hardware or software um, faults held by other departments within the post office? No. A, a duty of disclosure doesn't start with um, the prosecutor going to third parties. Is that right? It must look at which material it itself possesses. Yes, I mean, it, it can think about both things at the same time, but, but it has to think about what it's got itself, absolutely. What would you have expected for a prosecutor of this nature, i.e. a repeat player of many um, years vintage, it had been in the business of prosecuting people for hundreds of years, to have had by way of systems for... Um, retaining, uh, then obtaining by a prosecution division, uh, analysing, recording, and then disclosing? Gosh. Um, as, a, as a prosecutor, um, they should have recognised that they had duties under statute to um, complete the three R's in relation to material, um, they needed to recognise that they were relying on the operation of a computer system as the basis for um, a whole series of prosecutions, uh, and that the reliability of that system was a potential issue in those cases, and that material that was relevant to the question, or potentially relevant to the question of reliability, had to be retained had to be reviewed and had ultimately to be disclosed. And they had to um, recognise that if they were in the criminal law department um, and that the material as to the operation of the Horizon system was kept in a department down the corridor, um, they needed to go down the corridor. They couldn't just look at what was in their own office. Did you see any appreciation um, by either the investigators or the lawyers that there were lots of other departments down the corridor, including departments that um, had as a function uh, liaising with the um, uh, manufacturer and operator of the system, Fujitsu, over faults with it? No, I think the only departments that would get mentioned in, for example, investigators' reports other than the criminal law department that they would be sending their report to with the contract managers um, and the auditors. Um, and that's because it was the auditors that were identifying the shortfall um, on the system in the first place and the contract manager who would be making a decision about whether to sack the postmaster or not. Um, I think that was it. And so no recognition that down the corridor, as you put it, so elsewhere within the business, there were whole teams of people, um, most of whom were called managers, um, uh, whose job it was to liaise on a daily basis with the post office, uh, or between the post office and Fujitsu, 
over Horizon Fault. Um, whether they appreciated that or not, um, the material I've seen doesn't say because it doesn't mention them. No. Instead, was the um, the vista that was looked at by investigators and prosecutors um, what is within the investigation team and what is within the prosecution team, um, sometimes extending to what happened at audit. Yes, and, and so by way of example of that, they might, um, because they had it from the audit, look at um, transaction logs, which are derived from, as I understand it, from the Horizon system, but um, were things they had because the auditor had got them. Um, they wouldn't look at anything that they hadn't got as a result of that process um, or ask for it. Thank you. Can we turn to the case of um, Angela Sefton and Anne Neild? Yes. And I think you've uh, noted that these cases um, uh, were being dealt with in an overlapping way um, and including in an overlapping way with Alan. Is, is that right? Yes. And in the the um, email from Ms. Panter we looked at earlier had a little list of cases, including that of Mr. Allen, including that of, of these two, uh, and Mr. Ishak as well. And therefore, similarly, if we turn up FUJ 0012 um, in the case of Sefton and Neil 2 on the 3rd of um, uh, December 2012, Mr. Jenkins is making the point back to Mr. Bolt. Um, uh, please tell me uh, exactly what you want from me, also in relation to the Sefton and Neild case. Yes. And he makes the point in the email that um, he hasn't been presented with any audit data relating to any of these cases, including Sefton and Neild to examine. Yes. And he makes suggestions about what might be done. Yes. Um, if we go to poll 308, 9394. And um, if we go um, down, please, to the 3rd of uh, December, uh, reply from Mr. Bolt. The only clarification I think I need at the moment um, relates to the timeline 2005 removal of cash. Could you clarify what this means and discount it? as a possible explanation for the losses being to occur, um, beginning to occur at that time in the Sefton and Neild case. Audit reports will simply show the money missing, so we'll not take things um, further. Again, does that contain the loaded language um, about which you were critical before? Yes. Because it's an instruction as to what to do. Discount. Uh something as a possible explanation? Yes. Would you say that Mr. Bolch's rejection of obtaining the ARQ records in these cases uh, was consistent or inconsistent with um, the approach of an open-minded prosecutor? Inconsistent. It was a reasonable line of inquiry. It was allied almost inevitably to duties of disclosure. Uh, Mr Jenkins signed a witness statement in this case on the 5th of December 2012. That's poll 3059424. Um, so again, um, so I think this is the 5th of December, maybe the 6th of December, um, uh, 2012, identical to the generic statement that had been signed back in October 2012, except for an additional paragraph addressing um, an aspect of Mr. Uh, of Miss Sefton and Miss Neild's case. If we scroll down, we can see that. 
Um, scroll down and again. And again. Um, it begins, um, uh, in substance, I've been asked to provide a statement in the case of Angela Sefton. I understand the integrity of the system has been questioned. And this report provides some general information regarding the integrity of Horizon. And then if we go over the page, please. Uh, generic statement that we're um, all familiar with. If we carry on, please. And again. We scroll through just to see this is the generic statement that we're familiar with. Yes. And keep going. And stop. Um, and then just at the foot of, um, which is over the page, please. And we can see the um, line at the conclusion where Mr. Jenkins says, I would conclude by saying, I fully believe the Horizon system will accurately record all data that is submitted to it and correctly um, account for it. It cannot compensate for any data that is incorrectly input into it as a result of human error, lack of training or fraud, nor can any other um, system. I think I skipped over, I think it was page two. If we can just go back to page two. Yes, there's a reference to the defense statements on page two. Yes. <coughs> If we scroll down, please. Yep, there. Um, that losses started in 2005 and that Horizon was installed at that time. Horizon was rolled out in 1999 and 2002. So I'm surprised that the reference to 2005, there was a change implemented in late 2005, the removal of the weekly cash report. They were thoroughly tested at the time. There's been no indication of there being any issues regarding this change. And the change has no impact on the overall integrity of the system, as outlined in the um, statement. Y you've seen now how the um, generic statement came about, and the emails um, involving Ms. Panter and Mr. Bolsch uh, on the one hand, and Mr. Jenkins on the other in November 2012 insofar as that statement was adapted to deal with the um, Sefton and Neild case. Yes. Would you agree that those um, underlying communications um, demonstrate that it was uh, the post office's um, idea and intention that the statement should be a generic one? Yes. Uh, that it was um, represented to Mr Jenkins, secondly, that the cases in which his generic statement was being provided were not cases which raised specific horizon issues? Specific issues, no. Uh, that when he sought clarity um, on what that meant and what could be done, um, uh, the post office, through its lawyers, declined suggestions that further investigations be carried out? Yes. He wasn't, um, in any case, forthly provided any instructions uh, proper instructions as an expert in these cases? No. Uh, less still instructions that were specific to uh, the issues that arose in any of these cases? Quite. Um, in paragraph 566 of your report, um, which is on page 199, you say that um, Mr Jenkins' statement in the Sefton and Neild case, 
is generic in its content. It mirrors that served in the case of Allen, in which Mr. Jenkins' statement reviewed data specific to that defendant and said he had also run through hypothetical issues with integrity and included there were no, concluded there, were no, there was no evidence of any issues. Yes, in fact, it's, it's clearer to me now from the material I've further seen that, that he hadn't um, reviewed data specific to that defendant in the way that I thought he had. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you tell us in uh, paragraph 565, which is on page 198, uh, that there's no reference by Mr. Jenkins um, in his statement to his own 2010 report addressing an, um, a fix for an identified bug. Yes, the same, yes, the same point I made in relation to Mr. Allen in that case. But we should read that across. Yes. Thank you very much. Sir, it's five to three now. I wonder whether we could take the afternoon break now and return at five to four, at, um, at 10 past four. 10 past three, sorry. <laughs> so that, that's my um, alter ego speaking. Yeah. Can you just um, give me a, a clue about um, how much longer you'll be and whether or not there are likely to be uh, questions from core participants' representatives? Um, so, yes, I'm um, intending to pick up at 10 past three and finish by four o'clock. Um, I think there will be some questions from two or three uh, CP representatives, each of which is um, five minutes or so. Right, fine, thank you.
Uh, so, good afternoon. Can you uh, see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, can we turn to the case study, Mr. Atkinson, um, lastly, of um, um, Kayam um, um, Ishak? Uh, can we dive straight in with the material, please? Um, by looking at poll 305 9481. Again, this is about the genesis of um, Mr. Gareth Jenkins' statements. Poll um, 305, thank, thank you, 9481. And um, if we scroll down, please, email from Mr. Jenkins to Ms. Panter of the 8th of January. Thank you there. Um, copied to Penny Thomas. Rachel, I've taken my previous statement and amended it to refer to the Ishak uh, case. That's the generic statement that he's yes. saying he's taken. Reading through the prosecution and defence summaries, I don't think there is anything for me to comment on specifically. Please, can you confirm this is all you need in this case? If so, I'll get a signed copy together with the related exhibits um, to you. And then if we uh, scroll up, please. Um, morning, Gareth. Thank you for your statement, which I've had the opportunity for you uh, to read. There's nothing that you need to add. It covers everything. And then um, forwarded by uh, Miss Panter to Martin Smith, if we scroll up. Uh, please see below, I've read the expert's report and it is perfect. Um, in your report, it's paragraph 611. Um, on page 215, no need to um, display it at the moment. Um, you uh, characterise generally Mr. State, uh, Mr. Jenkins' statement um, of the um, 15th of January 2013, which is the one being referred to in these um, emails, as a generic one. Yes. Um, in the light of the emails that we've just looked at, um, would you agree that this was a case in which the post office sought a generic statement from um, uh, Mr. Jenkins? In the main, yes, although the email chain that we're looking at here, the email that um, we started at was a response from Mr. Jenkins to an email from Ms. Panter. On yes, if we scroll down in this chain, sorry to speak over you, Mr. Atkins. No, not at all. Um, the email head is at the bottom of page three, but the, yes. the content is on page four. Um, so, bottom of that page. Yeah, keep going. Uh, and so, Ms. Panter is, is, is sending Mr. Jenkins and copying um, a cast of thousands into uh, a list of cases and indicating what, in some instances, she is sending him. Uh, and if we scroll down a little further, point number five, five. in relation to the case of Mr. Ishak. Um, she provided him with a number of documents for his consideration, having asked him to prepare a report in that case and essentially setting out what Mr Ishak was saying. Um, and so it is not absolutely clear what it is she was asking him to do other than to prepare a report, but she was not on the face of that paragraph telling him not to properly examine the issues in relation to Mr Ishak. Um, I can understand, given the, the context and the history that we have gone through, why he may have considered she was just asking him to sign a copy of his generic statement um, for Mr Ishak's use, but um, equally it was open to him to have, as he did in other cases that we've looked at earlier, flag up things that had occurred to him having looked at those materials. And um Indeed, when he did provide a generic statement, a strictly generic statement, she, Miss Panter, regarded it as perfect. Yes. Um, here, I, I don't share her view as to its perfection. No. Um, here, um, 
she's providing him with a copy of uh, the indictment, the summary of facts, and the defence case statement. Yes. And identifying um, a claim um, by Mr Ishak that he was not dishonest, he had to make reversals in order to balance, and that there had been a malfunction with the Horizon system. Yes. Um, can we go forwards then um, a couple of weeks until after um, th this statement had been signed off to the 31st of January 2013, uh, poll 308 9427. And if we um, scroll down, please. And again, to the 31st of January. Um, there we are, thank you. Um, Rachel Panter to uh, Gareth Jenkins and lots of other people. Uh, week of 11th will be fine. Sorry, if we can scroll down a little further. And again. Um, if we scroll up a little further. Yeah. Um, Ishak, having served your report, the defence have queried it and are claiming that Ishak had to make false entries in order for the figures to reconcile as the Horizon system kept malfunctioning. That was something that he'd originally said. Yes. Uh, please could you make a note in your diary as you'll be needed to clarify our position with Horizon. And then, um, can I just check there's nothing underneath this email? Yeah, yes, um, it's there. If we just scroll up, please. Um, our barrister has asked if you could read the defence case statement attached and make a list of your initial thoughts on the assertions he is making. We may, we may uh, need you to add a few of these comments into your report so that each issue is addressed. Do you consider it um, an appropriate or an inappropriate approach to send a defence statement to a prosecution witness, whether an expert or not, for generalised thoughts or comments? It's unusual, certainly, um, in relation to an expert, and I couldn't imagine it happening in relation to a non-expert witness. In particular, was it appropriate, given the context, that the uh, post office had uh, not given Mr Jenkins the kind of instructions which ought to have been provided uh, to an expert, nor provided him with all of the material relevant to the issues in the case, nor giving him instructions as to what material himself um, to obtain. No, quite. Uh, looking at what should have been done, would, would this be right? The lawyers and the investigator should have looked at the defence statement and seen what disclosure obligations it gave rise to. Yes. Uh, looked for what issues that it um, raised and um, which questions therefore required to be answered and whether they were to be answered by expert or lay evidence. Yes. If expert evidence properly to have instructed an expert with written instructions complying with the obligations I mentioned earlier. Yes. Do you agree that... Um, in addition to being provided with relatively scant information, an indictment, a case summary, and a defence um, statement, um, asking Mr Jenkins to comment on the defence case or provide comments on a defence case was um, uh, risky. I suppose it would depend on what they plan to do with what he came back with, but um, certainly if they were then going to comply with their obligations properly, yes, it was. I mean, previously, the instructions had been, don't look at 
the specifics of any case, your generalized generic statement will do. They were now saying, we've got a defense statement here. Can you provide comments on it? And you're saying that the risk or the caution that um, needed to be applied, the risk that arose or the caution that needed to be applied was dependent on what was intended to be done with the, um, the reply. Yes, and, and I suppose that the issues might arise if um, Ms. Mr Jenkins identified something in a an aspect of the defence statement that was nothing actually to do with him uh, and expressed his view, for example, on the honesty or dishonesty of someone, um, that, that that would give rise to um, issues in and of itself. But um, assuming that he focused um, on those aspects that had a technical element to them, um, then clearly his answers to them um, were uh, potentially at least disclosable and, and given the lack of, of um, focus as to what they were asking of him, um, it could give rise to all kinds of disclosure issues because his answers were rather um, unprepared by anything they'd given him. This um, shift in approach yes. from the generic will do yes. to now we're delving into the specifics of a case, yes. was that a, um, a moment for the lawyers to grasp the instruction of an expert um, with both hands and to do it properly? Yes. Uh, can we look, please, at Mr Jenkins' comments on the defence case statement? Um, poll 3059602. Uh, comments on ISHAC defence case statement DCS authored by Mr. Jenkins on the 1st of um, uh, February. And he says he's been asked to comment on the defence case statement. I've copied the statement below in blue font and added my comments in black font. I'm not sure if the responses are of much use or that the responses are of much use. And I don't think there is anything that can really be added to my statement as a result. However, if you feel any of this could, be use, could usefully be added, I'm happy to be convinced. Much of it relates to requiring further data for analysis and past experience indicates that help may be required in understanding it. Um, I think you've seen this um, uh, document. Yes. Uh, Mr um, Jenkins, in addition to um, uh, suggesting um, that further data may be required for analysis and that help may be needed in order to understand it, uh, indicates in relation to horizon malfunctions that um, if the defence can specify some examples of this, I'm happy to investigate. However, I would, be, um, uh, I would contend that the system doesn't malfunction with leaving some trail to indicate what has happened without examining the logs, it's difficult to be more specific. In the light of that, uh, do you agree that at the very least there ought to have been a discussion or a formal follow-up to the comments uh, made about the need for further data analysis? Yes. In order for Mr uh, Jenkins um, to be able to look at the system malfunctions that Mr Ishak had complained about? Yes, well, it's a, again a, a two-stage um, matter. So far as the prosecution's obligations are concerned, um, Mr Ishak had raised um, concerns from experience with the operation of, of Horizon. They were being told by their experts that an analysis of the data would assist in relation to that, and, and that they um, didn't need to wait for Mr Ishak to give them further and better particulars for them to know that that's what clearly needed to happen next. Um, if there were further and better particulars from Mr Ishak, clearly that would further aid the process, um, but, but um, it, they weren't an essential, an essential prerequisite to anything being done at all. In paragraph 611 of your report, that's page 215. Yes. You say um, the default statement and exhibits of Gareth Jenkins were served in this case. As has been discussed before, its service, the statement is a generic one. 
do you agree that um, the provision and then service of a generic statement reflected the post office's intention that the statement be a generic one? Yes. And although Mr Jenkins explained his ability further to investigate the specific malfunctions of which Mr Ishak um, had raised, the post office did not in fact ask Mr Jenkins to do so. No, that's right. Uh, yes, that can come down, thank you. The, the, the further observation I'd make about that though is that um, Mr Jenkins um, was being told that he was, um, in the earlier emails we'd looked at from Ms Panther, that was being told he was going to um, be called at trial to give evidence as to the integrity of the Horizon system. In his mind, um, to do so needed, uh, on, in that case, and given what was being said by the defendant in that case, he needed to look at the underlying data. So it wasn't just um, a, a matter for the post office, it was a matter for the expert exercising independent judgment to um, make clear to them that to do that, he would need to look at the data rather than it was just an option. Are you saying that that should have been done by him because he knew that he was going to be called and there would therefore come a moment at which um, it would be crunch time? He yeah. would be asked or he might be asked about specifics. And, and so, it, it, at the least, he, he, he could have said in the course of these exchanges in, in clear or more emphatic terms than he did here, if I'm asked questions about the operation of the Horizon system in relation to um, this particular post office, um, I need to look at the data to do that. What about um, the suggestion that uh, that was a function of the instruction of him being rather muddled, that he was told initially that the case raised no specific Horizon issues, then he was provided with some information about it. He wasn't asked to analyse underlying data. Um, what was he to do? Uh, that the instructions were muddled um, is clear, that they were inadequate is clear, um, that he could have gone back to them um, and said more. I, I, I consider also, to be clear, I can, I can understand how it came about, um, but that doesn't mean that it was not, um, in my view, um, clearly incumbent upon him to at least continue that discussion before he found himself um, in the uncomfortable position of a witness box, um, dealing with these matters, having identified that there's work that he could do better prepare himself for it and not being asked to do it. Um, by um, September 2012, um, at least Cartwright King was aware that the defence had intended to instruct a forensic accountant. The cross-reference that we needn't look at it is poll 00119433. And then um, uh, four or five months later, Mr Jenkins was told about that. Um, if we look, please, at poll 00059808. Um, if we scroll down to the 14th of February, please. Thank you. An update. Uh, for you, Gareth, from uh, Miss Panther. <coughs> Our counsel, Mark Ford, would like you to attend court on the Monday before the start of the trial to allow you to discuss the case with the defence expert. This seems to be the first that um, I should say that Mr Jenkins knows that there is an expert. Yes. I think the rationale behind this is to narrow any issues that we may have with the defence from the outset so as to try and reduce the amount of time you're required to attend. Uh, our counsel is still waiting to hear from defence counsel and will update you, us if any issues arise. Our, your presence <coughs> on the first day will still be required so you can make your travel um, arrangements. Would you agree that suggesting to Mr Jenkins that he should attend 
on the first day of, of trial to um, uh, respond to um, or discuss uh, matters with a defence <coughs> expert was um, uh, alarming, given that Mr Jenkins had not been told about any expert before then. Um, that council had um, asked that there be a meeting between the experts to uh, narrow the issues um, in and of itself um, was a reasonable thing for them to have done. The rules now um, very much envisage that there will be a meeting between experts um, in advance of the trial in order to narrow the issues, um, but that is in advance of the trial rather than on the day it starts um, in the normal course of events. Um, the experts um, would, would not um, come upon each other by chance at that meeting. They would know in advance what the other one was saying so that they could have assessed the content of those reports. So, so it isn't a matter just of um, Mr Jenkins' um, travel arrangements that needed to be planned in advance. He also needed to see the material in advance. Um, uh, and arrangements need to be put in place for how the, the experts were to meet, what they were going to address, and how what they discussed was going to be recorded so that others outside that meeting thereafter knew the outcome. And so before this time, Mr Jenkins ought to have been told at least that there existed a defence expert. Um, yes, and, and if it was contemplated that he would need in any at any point to respond to anything in that report, which was perhaps inevitable, um, then he needed to see the document from the expert as well. Yes, i.e. the defence expert report. Yes. You just don't walk into the room with your hands in your pockets and say, what have you got to say? No, quite. Who are you and what are you doing here? Yes. Yes. Uh, and moreover, Mr Jenkins would not have known what material the defence expert had himself or herself examined. Quite. It would also, would this be right, um, mean that it would be difficult for Mr Jenkins himself to revert to any underlying data in advance of such a meeting to either um, decide whether to agree or to disagree with suggestions made in the defence expert report? Yes, I clearly that would be a um, more realistic um, possibility if he had... Um, reviewed the underlying data himself before producing his original reports that Ms Ibbotson's report was a response to. But yes, um, one of the reasons why you, an expert should see any other expert's report in advance is, is so that they can check it. Can we look please at FUJ 0015-3977? Uh, we're now on the Monday, Monday the 18th. And we can see that uh, Mr Jenkins has a, um, a conversation with um, Penny Thomas. Um, uh, can you uh, make out the conversation? Yes. Um, Next week, I'm going to Bradford for the Ishak case. I see you had some ARQs on this, and he gives the string of them. Do you still have the info you can pass to me easily? Then he gives the branch code. I can copy um, all you quote above out for you. That would be good. Um, so at least I have the info, even if I don't have time uh, to analyse it And so it's apparent that Mr Jenkins was um, seeking to um, obtain material that might help him to ask, uh, to answer questions um, and liaise with the defence expert, even though um, he had not at that stage been provided with a copy of the report or known which issues to address. Yes, it's not clear to me 
where he had seen that they had some ARQs, whether that was because they were referred to in Ms Ibbotson's report or they were referred to in something else. But clearly something had told him that there was ARQ uh, material available and he had rightly recognised that he ought to see it. Um, how concerning was it that the post office as prosecutor was asking Mr Jenkins to go to court to respond to expert evidence without him having seen it? Um, well, it's moderately remarkable um, to, um, to expect um, any witness, but certainly an expert witness, to, to deal with um, complex issues and to try and narrow those complex issues with another expert, not knowing what that expert said, not knowing what material they had seen, not being able to check either anything that they had said or that they had seen. Um, I, I can't quite think how anyone thought that was a good idea. Moving on closer to the trial then, um, to the 22nd of um, February 2013, which I think is the Friday before the Monday, um, can we look please at FUJ 0015-3990? Um, if we scroll down, please. Oops, that's right. We can see um, some travel arrangements uh, being referred to on the 18th. And then if we go up, please. We can see Ms. Panter's reply if we keep going. On the 22nd, at quarter past 11 in the morning, there's some uh, material about the uh, Wiley case and then Urgent. Um, we can see there's an attachment, addendum defence case statement. Please see attached. The defence solicitors in the case of Ishak have served an addendum defence case statement on us this morning, which attempts to particularise the problems with the Horizon system. Please could you have a look at the comments they've made and try to address as many of the points as you can in order that we can email that to our council, Mark Ford, ahead of Monday's trial. Apologies for such a last minute request. I think there's no coincidence the service of the addendum defence case statement is last minute. And so at this point, there hasn't been, it seems, an attempt on the lawyer's part, Miss Panter's part, to analyse the defence uh, statement herself and isolate from it issues that Mr Jenkins uh, would in writing be asked to deal with? No. It's just a forwarding and saying, please deal with this, essentially? Yes. Uh, Mr Jenkins, response to that, please. Um, FUJ 0015 3997. Um, if we... Um, Let's see his reply at 10 past 1, same day, the Friday. Um, I've added my comments to the um, amended defence case statement. I've now had confer confirmation that Fujitsu have not supplied any details of any help desk calls to Post Office Limited regarding this branch. There's nothing I can easily do to address any um, specifics. And if we scroll down, please. Yeah, that was the response to the last minute um, request. Again, Mr. Jenkins was pointing out to the post office's lawyers uh, that he hadn't pr been provided with information that could be obtained by the post office in order to consider the very points raised by Mr Ishak? Yes. Can we go forward to FUJ 0015 6747? Um, if we um, see 
we're on the, um, the 25th now, the first day of trial at 9.37 in the morning. At Martin Smith sending to um, at Mr Jenkins the expert report. Yes. Um, with a blank email. Yes. So just an attachment. Yes. Um, this is Beverly Ibbotson's report. And later that day, um, if we look, please, at FUJ 0015 4006. Um, Ms. Ibbotson herself sent uh, Mr. Jenkins at just after two o'clock the um, appendices, and there are lots of them, to her report, which Martin Smith, the solicitor, had not done. I think we can follow that up by looking at the um, attachment to Martin Smith's email earlier in the day. You yeah. see, it was just a bald report rather yes. than the attachments and so was the result of that to your understanding that mr jenkins had to deal overnight with this uh, rather detailed forensic accountancy report which he had seen for the first time on the first day of trial yes that would appear to be the position he wasn't uh, unlike miss ibbotson a forensic accountant no he hadn't been provided with any formal written instructions to be an expert in the case uh, nor had he been provided with any broader background to the case. Beyond, as we've seen... Indictment, case summary, defence case exactly. statement. Yes. Um, he had not been asked to obtain the data, albeit off his own bat had obtained some ARQ data. Yes. Um, from um, uh, Penny Thomas. Would you agree with my characterisation of... Um, this episode of this part of the prosecution being run chaotically and with little or no grasp as to the significance of uh, the need properly to instruct an expert? Yes. The, the, the focus in this case appeared from the investigative and prosecutorial point of view to be that Mr uh, Ishak had made um, allegations against uh, an employee or a, a colleague, um, there was a lot of focus on him and not a lot of focus on anything else. Um, if we turn up paragraph 619 of your report, <coughs> which is on page 218, You say that 218 page um, and then paragraph 619. Although Mr Jenkins was engaged, he was not asked to analyse the underlying data and there were serious shortcomings uh, to the disclosure of material within his um, uh, knowledge relevant to the operation and reliability of the system and as to cross-disclosure from other cases. This continued to be the position even after focused defence request and the instruction of a defence expert who, like other experts before her, relied on the material and information provided by Mr Jenkins to reach her conclusions. That last part, um, is that in fact in, in error that she wasn't reliant on what Mr Jenkins provided her? Yes, I think that must be right. Um, in this case, as in others, um, is it right that disclosure was not made in relation to the earlier bugs, errors and defects in particular, which had emerged in the um, Seema Misra case? That's right. Thank you very much. Those are the questions um, that I ask you. There may be some additional questions from other core participants. I think starting with Mr. Steen. Thank you. Thank you. 
Mr Atkinson, you're aware that I represent a large number of sub-postmasters and mistresses. Yes, um, you. you answered questions from Mr Beer earlier on as to whether there was a system in place that allowed those investigating or lawyers dealing with the prosecution of sub-postmasters the ability to access material down the corridor. Yes. Um, can we just take that one stage further? You're aware, I believe, that uh, uh, there, was, uh, there were two helplines set up for sub-postmasters and mistresses, one set up by the post office itself and the other, if I can call it loosely, a Fujitsu helpline. Yes. Regarding the Fujitsu helpline, you're further aware that that had uh, four layers to it, a simple, if you like, answer uh, the uh, telephone and... Uh, uh, we believe, driven by scripts, those answering the telephone, uh, our clients say, would basically tell our clients to pay up if there was a shortfall. But there were also other layers to the helpline run by Fujitsu, which were resolving issues if there were issues concerned with the Fujitsu Horizon system. Is that correct? You're aware of that? Um, not in, to any great extent, um, not least because there wasn't very much discussion of the different layers of, of the Fujitsu helpline in any of the material that I saw. But outline, you're aware that there was such a helpline? Yes. And you're aware that there were individuals involved in uh, the process of and uh, uh, fixing issues, bugs, errors, defects within the Horizon system insofar uh, as they could? Uh, certainly I was aware that there were um, people who could be called at Fujitsu when there was a problem, um, whether it was um, identifying bugs or not, is a separate question. Right. So not only would you have, if you're investigating um, a particular branch, an inability to access a library of faults and problems with the system, but also have you seen any way that investigators and lawyers would have access to the results of the telephone um, line complaint system? Um, well, they were clearly able to obtain um, records um, and the content of contacts with the post office's own helpline um, because there are references to that. They were clearly able to obtain records of and the content of contacts with the Fujitsu line because there were occasions when um, I think it was a gentleman called Mr Dunks made statements um, in particular cases, about selections from that. Did you see anything to suggest that there was a joined-up type of thinking, that uh, when su one sub-postmaster was saying that the system won't work, can't find out what it is, there are these problems, and try to explain it, that that was then linked to other individuals that were making similar complaints? No, on the contrary, they would, um, when they did it at all, um, would look just at calls from the person they were investigating to the helpline rather than on some occasions, even other people at the same branch. So we've got a lack of access to overall the picture of what's going on and the faults within the system. We've got a lack of overall access to the uh, complaints and the difficulties that have been encountered by sub-postmasters and mistresses. Do you agree? Do you, do you mean access by a defendant? Uh, access, first of all, by investigators and the lawyers. In the sense that they didn't access yes. it rather than they couldn't access it. Yes, yes I agree. Let's move on to the other way around. Now, you've been giving evidence in relation to the system of disclosure that is operated through the criminal justice system uh, in the criminal courts. Yes. That's a system that operates in both the magistrate's court and the crown court, yes? Yes. Um, and you've been giving evidence about the disclosure system that is used by prosecutors. Can we reverse the coin? So um, where an individual defendant is seeking to make um, further applications for disclosure. There's a system for that as well, isn't there? Yes. Right. So what we have, in fact, as a picture that relates to disclosure is, uh, in theory, what it should, how it should operate is that the prosecution should identify uh, relevant material that might or may assist the defence case. Yes. OK. Now, there then is a system that relates to the provision of a defence statement by an individual where the defence statement is not mandatory, but essentially it is what happens in the courts. Uh, the individual will then set out what their case is. Yes. Okay. Now, that system has been in operation now for some time. 
Yes. Okay. Clearly, until there is disclosure by the post office of the bugs, errors, and defects within the system and the problems that the system can cause, in other words, create shortfalls, um, create hidden losses, um, it is very difficult for the defence to make applications based upon that material. Yes. The applications that can be made through the process, Section 8 applications, is that correct? Yes. And that would be um, uh, essentially um, saying that uh, uh, we wish to have material that relates to a particular aspect of a defence case. Well, it, it, it's certain we have reason to believe that you have material that will help us in relation to this. Yeah. And, and the way that that can work, and you've been, um, uh, you've prosecuted many cases and you well know that I've defended in many cases. The situation is that a defence, if once on notice of such material, can then make an application for it. Um, if you're prosecuting the case, you can respond with the release of material that you believe is relevant to that request. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and that process can continue. In fact, it can be quite a continuation of a process as more and more material is targeted and found for disclosure purposes. Yes. Uh, eventually, a judge is, um, is brought in to sometimes resolve any issues that lay between the parties. Yes, um, and the, the, the stage that um, can intervene between those is, is particularly after the service of a defence statement. And as was the case in most of these cases, um, there are letters from defence solicitors asking for further disclosure without going to the extent of um, waiving Section 8 at the prosecution, because the prosecution have a continuing duty of disclosure. Uh, and so the defence ask, um, and it is often if the prosecution um, either responds saying no um, or don't respond, that a Section 8 application may follow. Yes. So where we're talking about the starting point, the, the inability or the failure to look into uh, the questions of errors and defects within the system that you've been discussing with Mr Beer, when we're looking th at that as a starting point, we, we don't in fact find that there's much of a, an ability for the criminal justice system to bite on these disclosure processes as you go through, unless you get that starting point right. Um, all, all, all that can happen is that um, against a, a, a blanket of, um, of silence in relation to a particular topic is the defence can ask um, for disclosure of material that might um, touch on the reliability of the system, as in most of these cases they did. Um, but there is a, a limit to how far that can go, certainly in terms of any particularity, without something to bite on your right. Now, other aspects of, that you've been discussing with Mr. Beer relate to individual sub-postmasters um, that have, uh, Mr. Holmes is an example of this, that uh, complained about the system, said that this thing, the machine wouldn't work, essentially, he yes. was saying, and that he rolled over, uh, essentially um, didn't account for those losses in the way that uh, arguably the post office required, because otherwise he couldn't keep the post office open. You're aware of that? Yes. So essentially people were placed in an invidious position. Do you agree that sometimes faced with what was um, uh, an unaccountable loss, they would then have to try and account for it? And those sorts of cases were dealt with in the Criminal Court of Appeal um, in the, case, the um, combined case of Hamilton. So that individual pleas of guilty, even to false counting, were overturned. Do you agree? I'm not sure it's for me to express a view on the... the nature of their position. I can confirm that that is what was said in a lot of these cases that I considered and what was said in a lot of other cases as well that were dealt with under the blanket of, of the Hamilton decision. The burden on criminal solicitors and uh, defending solicitors and uh, defending counsel was therefore made rather, uh, I'd about to say more difficult, but made very difficult indeed. Um, stymied in relation to disclosure processes and an entire system that seemed, thwart, that seemed to thwart the ability for sub-postmasters to make good what was going on at the post office branch. Do you agree? Um, I think slightly disentangling that. I think um, from the position of, of those acting for a defendant where they were, their instructions were, uh, if, if they were in accordance with the interview, um, I don't know why this happened, but it must be the system because I can't explain it otherwise. Um, that they would be up against, um, particularly once generic statements started floating about um, a, a, 
a positive assertion that there isn't something wrong with the system. And so you have, on the one hand, a defendant saying it must be the system. You have the prosecution's evidence saying it's not the system. A and you then have to decide whether you, you allow um, your client to, to proceed to trial um, against that wall um, or whether you discuss with your client the possibility that a plea to something less than theft will keep them out of prison. Uh, and that's a, a decision I wouldn't, a, or a conversation I wouldn't envy anybody. You've been referred by Mr. Beer to a document. I'll take you back to it, please. P.O.L. 000 Statement of Mr. Jenkins. <clears throat> I've seen a few of those. My screen's not working, so I'm just going to use uh, um, Mr. Jacob, so I can see it from afar. Someone actually. Sorry. Now, you'll see there that in relation to Mr. Jenkins' statement, that uh, if you look at the first page, and if you take your eyes down to the first part of the page, you'll see a sentence that um, says, however, I understand um, that my role is to assist the court rather than represent the views of my employers or Post Office Limited. Yes. Now, in your statement, uh, as an example of page 241, page uh, paragraph 674. Yes. You discuss there your um, issues that have been brought to your attention regarding the instruction of Mr. Jenkins. Yes. And have you found anything within the material that you've examined that explains why it is in Mr. Jenkins's statement, he also refers to his own statement as a report within the body of that document, have you found anything that explains why it is Mr. Jenkins's report stroke statement says, however, I understand that my role is to assist the court rather than represent the views of my employers or poll? No, I mean, it, it's not... Um because they didn't discuss with Mr Jenkins or provide for Mr Jenkins instructions as to his role as an expert at all. There's nothing in the post office communications with him that told him that. Um, Is that a normal sentence or paragraph to find within a statement, an ordinary witness statement? It's part of a normal um, sentence. Normal for who? Normal um, for what type of witness? Well, you, you would normally expect to see a much more um, detailed explanation of um, an expert's understanding as to what their role was and who they were there for. Um, you might find a sentence rather more like that um, um, in, in the statement of a witness who is making clear that they're speaking for themselves rather than for their employer, for example, if they were give, giving um, um, not expert evidence, but um, factual evidence about a situation that occurred at work. Um, they might make clear they were speaking for themselves rather than for anybody else. But um, if this was seeking to be um, ticking the boxes of the criminal procedure rules in relation to what a statement from an expert should say about their role as an expert, then it doesn't do it. But it's a curious um, sentence to have within such a statement, because it, what it appears to do, at least in part, is provide um, <coughs> a, a direction of travel going towards an expert report. Do you agree? It, it perhaps shows an awareness that um, he was providing evidence as an expert without really understanding what, um, or at least setting out what that meant. Yeah. And obviously you're not privy to any discussions, oral discussions, between uh, Mr Jenkins uh, and solicitors or advisers on behalf of the post office? No, or indeed of Fujitsu. Thank you, Mr Jackson. I think Mr Maloney uh, has some questions as well, sir. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr Beer. And Mr Atkinson, I represent a large number of postmasters. Yes all of whom are prosecuted and convicted, yes. and all of whom have since had their convictions overturned. Thank you. And I wish to just ask you about the case of Kayam Ishak. Yes. And if at any time you can't hear me, please say so. You're very kind. <clears throat> I want to ask you about disclosure 
around what happened in Birkenshaw Post Office after Mr Ishak was suspended. Now, Mr Ishak was very clear from uh, very early in the proceedings that the horizon system was the cause of the apparent shortfalls he'd suffered. Yes. I think he also made reference to a, someone who, else who worked there, but um, yeah. Horizon was um, part of his account from the outset. Well, he was essentially saying that one of the people who worked there had also done the balancers, and, yes. and so that needed to be looked at. Yes. And, and that, absolutely. And yes. indeed, you referred to that gentleman, Mr. Leaka Ali, during your evidence when being asked questions by Mr. Beer. Yes. Now, I just want to show you a few documents, if I may, around. This issue I've raised about disclosure after Mr. Ishak was suspended and, and, and get your views on the disclosure process around this issue. Yep. Okay. So the first document I'd like you to look at, if you would, is POL 20 Yeah, here we are. And this is an email from Martin Smith on the 28th of January 2013. And um, it's to Steve Bradshaw, who was the investigator in this case, yes. the lead investigator, copying in Mark Ford, now Mark Ford King's counsel, who was prosecuting counsel in the case. Yes. It, usual introductions. But the, the final paragraph I'd like to take you to, it's um, down towards the bottom of the page, and we, we probably read it without having to focus in on it, but it says... Given the stance which the defendant is still taking with regard to the matters flowing of the horizon system, or the malfunctioning, rather, of the yes. horizon system, is it possible to establish whether the subsequent sub-postmasters had any problems with the horizon system? After all, the kit in the branch would presumably have remained the same. Many yes. thanks, Martin. So what we see there is that by the 28th of January... Mr Smith thought it a good idea to prove that any discrepancies could not be due to the Horizon system or its associated kit by reference to what had happened to the sub-postmasters after Mr Ishak had been suspended. Yes. Yeah. By the 31st of January, that email being the 28th of January, so some three days later, Mr Bradshaw had completed and signed a statement which was served as part of a note of additional evidence. And that statement is POL three zeros five nine five nine two. So this is three days after that email, Mr. Smith, the solicitor, the reviewing lawyer, suggesting that um, this issue be addressed. And it's over to the second page of this statement. You see, that's dated the thirty-first of January, twenty thirteen. Yeah. And we see that um, at starting the next audit was in February 2011, when Mr Ishak was suspended and a discrepancy in the, account, in the accounts was discovered. The cash and stock was then transferred to an interim sub-postmaster in February 2011 and accepted as being correct. The cash and stock was again transferred to a new interim sub-postmaster in September 2012 during the subsequent transfer of cash and stock after Mr Ishak's suspension in February 2011, no problems or discrepancies have been reported. We see there. <coughs> yes. Yeah. So that statement was, as we see, served in the prosecution case. It wasn't unused material. It was part of the prosecution case, designed to assist in demonstrating that there were no problems with the system. Yes. And that's pursuant to that suggested email, that, that suggestion in the email from Mr Smith to Mr Bradshaw on the 28th of, of, of January. Yes, so it would appear. Yeah. <clears throat> there was then um, a mention of the case of Ishak in early February of 2013. And if we could put up the document POL 30s, Five nine six five two. Five nine six five two. Yep. Yeah. We see this again. It's an email from Martin Smith. It's dated the sixth of February, 
and it shows that Mr Smith had been to Bradford Crown Court on the morning of the 6th of February for the mention, and the defence were unable to persuade the judge to order any further disclosure. It's to Steve Bradshaw again, with Mark Ford copied in again. The important paragraph is the second one. The defendant solicitor told me that the defendant still operated the store in which the post office is situated. The defendant had instructed them that both subsequent sub-postmasters had told him that they had experienced problems with the Horizon system. Although you've said in your final statement that, quote, during the subsequent transfer of cash and stock after Mr Ishak's suspension in February 2011, no problems or discrepancies have been reported, the defence may well suggest that this does not necessarily mean that no problems were encountered by the subsequent SPM. I think it would be sensible to obtain statements from both subsequent SPMs confirming that they experienced no problems with the horizon system, etc. Yeah. So, first of all, Mr. Smith has got the statement of the 31st of January. Now he's looking for essentially corroboration of what Mr. Bradshaw says in that statement of the 31st of January by uh, seeking statements from the subsequent sub postmasters. Yes. essentially saying we better get some statements from those postmasters to support your assertion. There's then a letter dated the 8th of February 2013 from Mr Ishak Slisters to the um, post office and that is poll 305975 please. Thank you very much. And if we scroll down, please. So this is the 8th of February 2013. The mentions being on the 6th of February 2013. Two days later, we see Musa Patel, that's down at the bottom, as the solicitors for Mr Ishak. Um, and the second paragraph reads, further to the service of the additional evidence at page 43, Stephen Bradshaw's penultimate sentence states that no problems or discrepancies have been reported since the transfer to a new interim sub-postmaster since the suspension of Mr Ishak in February 2011. With regards to this, could you please clarify whether further inquiries were made, i.e. has a full audit been undertaken since February 2011, and if so, what was the outcome of that audit? If no discrepancy has been highlighted from a subsequent audit, then please be on notice that we will require that data to commission our own audit. And then they look forward to the response. So um, the defence is essentially saying, we know that you say, and this is on the basis of Mr Bradshaw's statement, that there's no reported discrepancy, but have you done an audit? And if there is no discrepancy, we want to carry out our own audit, and actually you know that we've got an expert in place to be looking at this in any event. Yes. Yeah. So putting them on notice, as they say, that they will carry out that audit, please. There's then another email from um, Mr Smith, this time to trial counsel Mark Ford, and this is POL 30-59675. Thank you. Um, is that right? I'm sorry, I've just given you the same reference to the letter from Musa Patel, and I'll just have to check the... Um, I'll just have to check the appropriate reference for the email. In fact, I, I can read the email rather than going back to that. But it's quite short. Uh, and it reads as follows. Hi, Mark. So it's to Mr Ford from Mr Smith, copying in Mr Bradshaw. Just to keep you in the loop, please find attached a copy of a letter which we've received from Musa Patel's today. So that shows that the email is the, is the 8th of February or thereabouts, and it refers to the letter that you've seen from Musa Patel's. Right. 
Steve is in the process of taking statements from two subsequent sub-postmasters who have not experienced any problems with the Horizon system. They've not had any significant shortages. So essentially, following up on what he said to Mr Bradshaw about getting the statements. Yes. Then referring to the request from Moose Patel, he says, I do not propose to ask Steve to obtain the data for the period following Ishak's removal. Given that there were no problems with the system and no significant shortages, it would not assist the defence or undermine the Crown's case. So he's essentially saying to Mr Ford, they want the data, Mr Bradshaw's getting the statements I suggested, and he tells him he's made a decision that they're not going to get the data on what is essentially the disclosure test. It won't assist or undermine because we have the statement from Mr Patel saying there were no significant shortages. And he's notifying Mr Ford of the line he's going to take. Yes. Now, we don't have Mr Ford's reply to that, but we do have the letter that Mr Smith then sent to the defence. And that is um, POL 30059729. And it's the first paragraph of that, and it's dated the 15th of February of 2013. And it reads, thank you for your letter of the 8th of February 2013. We enclose in duplicate copies of a notice of additional evidence the statements of Stephen Bradshaw of the 11th of February 2013 and Abdullah Patel of the 13th of February 2013 and an up-to-date page count. There is no further disclosure to be made in this case. Now, that's one sub-postmaster, Mr Patel, and um, essentially... Um, that statement simply says I've had no significant shortages and there's been no problems with the kit. And then simply says, and no further disclosure to be made. Now, the purpose of these statements was to make the point that because subsequent sub-postmasters had experienced no significant shortages, then there could have been no problems with Horizon in Mr Ishak's office at the time he was involved with it. Yes. It was thus a point that the prosecution relied on in respect of a material issue in the case. And it was therefore incumbent on the prosecution to prove the point. I, I couldn't hear you then, Mr. Oh, I'm so sorry, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and having commenced on that strategy for proving their case, it was an important part of proof of the integrity of Horizon. Yes. And the defence, in saying that they wish to audit the data for that period, was indicating that it wished to put the prosecution to proof on that point. Yes. Now, if the data for Birkenshaw Post Office, after Mr Iqbal's suspension, had shown that there had been shortages, that would obviously undermine the prosecution case. Yes. It would mean that the prosecution couldn't prove its point on that part of the case. Yes, it would probably go beyond that in terms of calling the operation of the system into question, as Absolutely. well as proving that their specific point on it wasn't a valid one. And as a natural corollary of that, it would assist the defence case. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, as the reviewing lawyer, could Mr Smith, uh, forgive this, it may be a rhetorical question, could he know that the data would not undermine the prosecution case or assist the defence case without seeing the data or asking Mr Bradshaw even to get the data? I suppose it's a two-stage thing. If he had, and it's not clear if he had from what you've shown me, if, if he had the results of audits that showed at points during that period that there was nothing um, untoward, um, that would allow him then to assess whether the underlying data um, took matters further. But on the face of this, they weren't even giving any results as to audits. And wasn't he, in, a, in essence, refusing the defence the data to make its own checks on that point that the prosecution wished to prove? Certainly on, on what you've taken me through, it appears that the defence was saying, in the first instance, have you looked to see whether there are any problems by looking for audits? 
that question, as far as I can see, was never actually answered, um, nor indeed asked um, by the reviewing lawyer of the investigator. Uh, and so the decisions that, on the face of it, were being made were being made in the absence of, of knowledge, which is never the right position to be making disclosure decisions about. And simply a bare assertion that there is no further disclosure to be made without any explanation of that. Well, making the assertion there's no further disclosure to be made when, on the face of it, he didn't know whether there was any further disclosure to be made. Thank you very much. That's all I asked, Mr Atkinson. And I think, lastly, uh, Mr Henry, sir. Mr Atkinson. Mr Henry, before you start, I unfortunately have to, to rise at 4.25 today. Um, I've got no choice in the matter, so I'm sorry you're confined to 10 minutes, but you'll have to blame your colleagues who told me they'd be five minutes and took about half an hour between them. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, Mrs Adedeo's overturned conviction, you will agree, is a shortfall case. Uh, yes. Because, of course, as an irreducible minimum, the calculations that gave rise to the shortfall are dependent upon data generated and provided for by Horizon. Yes. And I don't ask you, of course, to comment on the merits of this, but a shortfall which she had a stark choice whether to submit to them the figures, that is, sign off on the figures, or cease trading, while still remaining liable for the shortfall. Yes, again, I, I'm not um, familiar with the details of the contract, but that is my understanding from what I've seen. Yes. Now, you are also now aware that before Mrs Bernard, the investigator, had arrived at the scene, there was the backdrop of an interview conducted by an auditor in breach of pace. Well. I'm aware that there was, that there had been a conversation between um, Mrs. Adadeo and the auditor. The material, I have to say, that I'd seen certainly before the end of last week, as to the nature of that and the extent of that conversation, was very unclear. Um, the investigation report, for example, didn't really fill in the gaps as to what had happened, and there, I think, was no statement from the auditor. But that it resulted, that's correct, but it resulted in what I'm going to describe in inverted commas as a confession, did it not, although of an equivocal nature? Certainly there was reference in the investigation report to um, admissions having been made, which were then um, addressed in the sense there were questions were asked about them in the interview, um, Mrs Adadeo's answers about them rather less clear to uh, exactly. To follow. Now, that interview that was actually later conducted following that, what I'm going to describe as the equivocal confession to the auditor at the scene, but the formal interview conducted by Mrs. Bernard was, uh, well, it elicited contradictory, confusing, and internally inconsistent answers, as uh, you have accepted. Yes. Um, described by counsel to the inquiry as baffling, and you don't disagree with that? No, I don't. No. Yet no attempt was made by Mrs Bernard to investigate Mrs Adedeo's bewildering account to probe or question the overall effect, in other words, as to whether there was any truth in the uh, mysterious payments to third parties to whom she claimed she owed and had paid money. Certainly, I saw no evidence of such inquiries, no. No. Um, and so, therefore, Mrs Bernard then approached, um, and I don't mean this pejoratively, an interrogatory approach. In other words, she elicited through close-ended questions or leading questions an account which she proffered to her superiors. Yes. Now, if there was a risk that Mrs Adedeo's account was unreliable because of things said or done, notwithstanding the paucity of the information that exists now, but of course the circumstances were very different then. If there was a risk that Mrs. Adedea's account was unreliable because of things said or done, it would have been all the more important, would it not, to have actually investigated independently of what she was telling Mrs. Bernard. 
if the investigator had concerns that it might be unreliable, then they needed to investigate it to ascertain whether it was or not. Yes. And we know from evidence given to the inquiry what Mrs Bernard um, said was her state of mind at the time was that she did not believe the account she'd been given, but she made no attempt, as she admitted to the inquiry, no attempt to investigate whether it was true or not. Yes, I, I haven't seen or, or heard Ms Bernard's evidence, but I understand that from what Mr Beer said a little earlier. Yes, but a, an examination of Mrs Adedeo's bank accounts conducted by a competent investigator would have established that there were no unexplained transfers of money in or out, no evidence of misappropriation or any payments alleged to those mysterious third parties. Um, so can I just, in conclusion, ask you if you agree with this? Are we not left with the impression that Mrs Adedeo's case was not properly investigated? Uh, I, I can't say what would have been found had Mrs Adedeo's bank accounts been examined, but then equally neither could the investigator because they didn't look. Yeah. So... Uh, and so it seemed to me that that was a reasonable line of inquiry, both to pursue what had happened to, to the money, to assess whether there had been dishonesty, and, as you rightly say, to assess whether the account Miss Adedeo had given was a reliable one or not. So we're left with the impression that it was not properly investigated. Um, and so, therefore, in those tests, it was not properly investigated. And, therefore, that it was questionable to even charge in such circumstances. Well, it was a, a situation where... Um, to an extent, I suppose, it would depend on the extent to which the investigator flagged up to the lawyer that whether there were any concerns about the account. If it was clear from... And I just don't remember, I'm afraid, um, whether it was clear from the investigation report that Mr Bernard had those concerns about the reliability of the account. If it was communicated in that way to the lawyer, then the lawyer, uh, in my view, ought to have been asking questions rather than making charging decisions. Exactly. Uh, and to adopt the word you use with perhaps characteristic understatement earlier, questionable to proceed in such circumstances without further investigation. Yes. Because we're left, are we not, with the... And we've got one more minute left. Left with the potential, are we not, that this was a false confession, a bewildering, baffling and internally inconsistent account, and that the underlying allegations could have been merely an artefact of system error. Yes, I think that's right. Thank you. I congratulate you, Mr Henry, on the conciseness of your question. And I thank you, Mr Atkinson, very, very much for all the assistance you've given me over a number of days at this inquiry. I'm extremely grateful to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. Uh, sir, we um, reconvene tomorrow with Lisa Allen at, I believe, 10 a.m. Yeah. Thank you. Which is the last witness for this year? Uh, th thank you for reminding me, Mr. Beer. Sir. See you tomorrow morning, everyone.